Hello there, welcome to the wonderful world of radio frequency and electronics engineering. On the bench for repair today is a Marconi Instruments radio communications test set. This model is a 2955A. There were many models in the range, um, but this radio test set has come to me for repair for a couple of things. Uh, apparently the keys, some of the keys don't work properly when you press them and are intermittent. And also it needs an alignment, adjustment, calibration of all the different instruments within it. Uh, now for those who don't know, the Marconi 2955 radio communications test set was first manufactured in the mid-1970s and continued production well into the mid-2000s. Indeed it had several uh, variants of it, being the 2955, the 2955A which is this model, the 2955R with a sensitive receiver option where this blanked off key here had the option for the sensitive receiver added and then became the more modern variant of this which was a white coloured front test set with rubber keys instead of plastic and uh, a more appealing modern looking radio test set uh, in the sort of mid 1990s which was a 2955B model um, and although the innards were mainly the same throughout the entire range there were some enhancements along the way but basically the functionality remained the same, the software improved and the firmware in order to uh, run the test set better and sort out little bugs and issues. But right from the start these radio test sets have been basically trouble free. Uh, they're the workhorse of many radio workshops throughout the world and indeed they were sold at many multinational markets across the world for all kinds of different sectors from manufacturing, defence sector, um, everything across the board really to do with RF design, engineering, maintenance, all that kind of thing was all thought about with these radio test sets. Indeed they have a capability not only to work from mains electricity but they also can work from DC batteries which can connect in the rear so they can be taken anywhere. Uh, hilltop radio sites, on the workshop bench, on an oil rig, in a ship anywhere and I've seen them used all over the world and indeed they made a rack mount version of it as well where the handle was removed and it was placed in a big 19 inch rack um, sort of shell and then rack mounted for doing things like ATE, automatic um, test equipment, measurements and things like that in a production environment. But these radio test sets have been the mainstay of many radio workshops for so many decades and they're so well known as well throughout the world in radio comms communications. And they're still as relevant today, even in the digital world, that they were back in the old analogue days. Now, the radio communication test set uh, offers multi-instruments within it, such as transmit power meter, TX modulation, frequency error, frequency counter, receive signal generator, variable attenuator, mod gens as well for receiver. We also have a duplex test facility as well where we can test a base station that can uh, as a repeater so it can transmit and receive at the same time and we have single port as well as split port duplex capability. Then we have the tone systems as well where the test set can emulate various tones signaling standards from DTMF, cell call signaling, it's different types of CTCSS and digital coded squelts DCS, POXAG paging as well for testing paging transmitters and receivers and then of course we've got the same old um, type of instrument that we've always become accustomed to on electronic benches such as the oscilloscope and there's a built-in oscilloscope within the unit um, which does carry an AC-DC coupling input on it We've got uh, filters as well on the unit which we can select or deselect for speech band, full band, in other words speech and signalling standards inclusive, 15 kHz low pass and high pass filters as well as 300 Hz sub audio tone filters for CTCSS. We've got so many things on this test set, bearing in mind when this was designed in the 1970s this was a world leader. And there weren't many other manufacturers at all. I don't think there were any, come to think of it, that back then made a full inclusive radio test set as this one is. And even today, they still work very well. They do suffer with common faults on them, such as the ON345 RF amplifier inside, the RF uh, amps fail on them, but there are modern equivalent replacements you can purchase. And there are still some original ON345s floating around. 
Um, but basically, the, the main problems that these had was noisy attenuators when you adjusted the RF attenuator and also um, issues surrounding the buttons and then more notably lately, which seems to be coming out, um, the line output transformer for the cathode ray tube failing. So these failed quite a lot and went short circuit and there were retrofit kits available to repair them but they seem to have wheedled away over the years. But other than that, the radio test set's very reliable, and you'll see on my channel as well many of the repairs that we've done on these radio test sets, including the newer B model. Um, we've repaired power supply issues, RF gem problems, you name it, we've gone through it on these radio test sets. So what we'll do, we'll switch the radio test set on, and we'll just do some measurements just to see what's uh, if anything's wrong with it. Obviously, we just need to confirm the customer's uh, fault of the keys not working properly, and then we can do some RF measurements. Um, but having turned the test set on, it's a good idea if you've got one of these yourself to leave it for about 15 20 minutes. Already, I can see some of the geometry on the display seems to be out of kilter, and uh, I can see it sort of um, moving its text height there and jumping up and down a bit, so we're going to have to look at that. Um, but straight away if we just go to the help and then select the self test menu and then let's see whether it passes all its self tests that's always the first sign of any trouble on the Marconi 2955 if the self tests any of them fail um, and then we could lead into you know diagnosing those problems along the way uh, what the self test does initially is it goes through different frequencies from 25 megahertz right up to a gigahertz at different RF levels, different modulation standards, be AM, FM and phase modulation, which are the three mod, mod standards that it can deal with. And then it checks that against its own internal TX uh, power meter and modulation meter. And it'll tune to different frequencies to check the frequency counter as well. Now if it gets any fails, uh, because her level's incorrect, it will put a failed code here with the error code in hexadecimal and we can cross reference that in the service manual then to a particular troubled area and as we can hear there all seems to be okay and the end of the test finishes with a 1 kilohertz tone all passed so that's good news and uh, we'll just do return now as well as that you might have noticed in the help menu as well there is a a guide on how to do transmitter testing and such like in there so you can go into different parameters and learn about how to do that which is handy rather than having to get the service man well the uh, instruction guide out every time you want to do something there's also a config menu you can go into which is change parameters with two pages to it where you can select different units of measure and set up your frequency standard your, your filters your default things GPIB modes and then obviously you can store that and and then go back so it's very user friendly, very flexible, very uh, ease of use radio test set. Um, and you know, if you've not had the opportunity to own one of these, um, then if you can pick one up, then do so because they're a very worthy asset in any radio or electronics workshop. Now, as well as the oscilloscope, general um, oscilloscope, which we get under the RX test and TX test, which we can select between scope and bar chart. Um, we've also got the inputs and outputs on the front of the instrument as well for AF input so we can couple audio signals in we can generate a signal coming out of here for testing audio amplifiers or uh, radio transceivers as well so there's so many uses other than radio that this particular test set can be used with particularly the audio type equipment and then we've got an external mod input for if we want different modulation standards where we could feed that in there to modulate the receive signal generator. We've got an accessories connector here, uh, which we can connect off to uh, Marconi accessories, one of which is an external RF power meter, which measures VSWR antennas, plus as well things like photometrically weight and filters. They can all connect in there. And then ultimately we've got the N-type male connector here, uh, female rather, which then allows connection of the RF power um, from a radio under test 75 watts maximum but you will notice in the manual it does say up to 150 watts peak 
um, and then we've got a low powered one watt port as well which is for low level signals gives greater accuracy for measuring very small signals and a really good useful port is that for when we're looking at diagnosing low power RF circuits such as pre-drivers or drivers, crystal oscillators or synthesizer um, circuits, VCOs etc you know this this is very good at picking those low level signals up as well and indeed uh, when that port's selected you can have a, an antenna on the front of the test set and then just by transmitting from a handheld radio in the workshop the test set will pick up that signal and display it on the, the analysis on the screen um, so we've got the scope position controls and we've also got the intensity for the display uh, volume control for when we're doing transmit measurements we can hear the speech that the um, radio test set picks up um, so that's about it really that's sort of like a little overview of the uh, of the test instrument and its capabilities obviously we've got a separate transmit uh, receive duplex as well where we can have single port or dual port duplex we have transmit on one and receive on the other uh, then also we've got tone standards so we can generate different modulation standards and we can see the screens differing about there um, but the sequential tones as well and different tone standards there uh, which was used mainly on many analog systems over the years and uh, then we've got DTMF as well where we can select DTMF tones and, uh, and on top of that as well we've also got uh, um, in the tones we've got Poxag as well but that's only available under the RX test not the TX test, if you go to TX and then go tones the Poxag disappears uh, so it's only under RX is that and then tones and then you can go into Poxag and generate a paging signal obviously to address a pager so uh, other than that I mean at this stage I'm using the um, radio test set the, the most commonly pressed buttons are obviously TX RX duplex and then obviously uh, RF gen frequency and then I can I can type in and they all seem to be working at the moment so yeah that's all working the zero key is working so they all seem to be working but we'll do some proper comprehensive tests obviously the uh, the tubes geometry is going up and down it's wobbling a bit so could be some issue there and then we'll do some RF testing as well where we'll connect to the uh, well we've got a choice of instruments here to check it we've got the Marconi microwave radio test set with the scalar uh, probes which are highly accurate and the RF power sensors that we can connect here to check the RF level output uh, for its correct dB attenuation we've got the spectrum analyzer as well that we can connect here uh, we've got a transmit source as well for calibrating the TX power um, and obviously we can make frequency accuracy measurements and uh, audio deviation for both transmit receive measurements as well to make sure that they're all working and feed levels in and out of here as well with a, a calibrated instrument that I have here to check the instrument against that but uh, I think first things first uh, we'll have a look at um, the basics first and then we'll get more involved yeah just another little thing I was just looking at the keyboard at the back here just to see what we were like with the solder joints and things on there but uh, just noticed something which may uh, answer the question as to why the keyboard might be erratic um, it's quite common on these test sets with the pressing of the um, the keyboard on the front that these screws that are up here there's three of them um, actually end up becoming uh, loose over many many decades of use and uh, if I just point to something in particular we'll just zoom in as well so we can see it a bit better but this is quite a common occurrence on these um, let's see if we can get this light in a bit better but you can see there this uh, this thing it's uh, and now it's it's definitely touching those um, those contacts on that uh, switch 
so as you can see there it's definitely going to be touching those shorting them out and that's that's the when you press that button in that's the tx button there in the top corner as i'm pressing it in that's the rx below it so th this is the tx um switch and that's the rx below it so obviously when they're pressing that in it's touching the um the actual contacts for the switch and then shorting it out to ground because obviously this is a chassis zero volt rail so it's going to short out that switch so it's going to cause all sorts of erratic thing normally on the 2955 the uh, the keys as and when they are on the way out uh, when you press them in uh, you normally have to put a lot more force on them so if you're just tapping away just lightly um, that force isn't enough on all keys to make the um, the the number appear whereas you, sometimes you have to sort of you know press it again or multiple times harder in order to get that um, particular digit to register and that's a sign of the tactile switch or the switch membrane itself uh, being dirty and crudded up you can unsolder them and clean them with switch cleaner and then put them all back but obviously there's a lot of labor involved in doing that stripping it down and getting the keyboard out in order to just do that um i have noticed as well on this particular radio test set the um the tx rx uh well actually the rx print there has just come off altogether it's um been totally eradicated as that so we might be able to do something about that as well uh but that's certainly not going to help the situation with the uh the little link down there that uh, little ground connection that's meant to flip up and touch this uh, chassis area here that's certainly not going to help it's uh, obviously going to cause you know short circuits and things and it's a common fault on them actually is that so we'll sort that out anyway but uh, admittedly the the keypad did appear to work quite fine for me earlier but it all depends you know, if you've got the, the test set on a bench where it's laid flat uh, without this, this leg here, where that's upwards, um, and obviously it's like that test set there on a, on a level, then obviously the, um, the issue is going to be that piece of metal is going to be touching then the, the keyboard. It's on the fact that we've got it elevated like this, um, or when it's moved about, you know, in transit or that kind of thing, that... Little metal things are going to probably rest somewhere where it shouldn't do as well. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so just on the geometry issue as well, we've got the uh, potentiometers down here uh, for the geometry. But I've noticed if I uh, pull on that potentiometer, you can just about... If I uh, just try and... If I just jar the potentiometer with my finger you can see the the image just moving like that just ever so slightly it was doing it more just a moment ago but uh, that's what I'm doing there as I'm as it's just if you watch the AF there look you can see as I'm doing it now jiggering it back and forth the geometry is just changing a little bit as well so just try the other pots as well but uh, yeah that's sort of a bit of a weird thing as well might be the pot's a bit dirty just needs a bit of a twiddle and just to clean its wiper uh, possibly a dry joint on it as well but we'll have to check that um, so yeah that's a bit of an oddball is that one these uh, these potentiometers so hmm interesting anyway it's more stable now than it's ever been so at least that's a little improvement even before we've actually done anything um but yeah we'll just have to check the uh the keys uh work fine and um obviously look into it a bit further okay uh it looks like the filter down here for the uh air filters all dropped to bits and coming out and likewise on the side there it's again pretty poor you know there's Obviously, uh, I've had them where there's mice living in them and things, but I don't think there's any in this one. But the filters are just deteriorated, so we'll 
replace those. But one of the uh, the common problems there are uh, with these is the uh, screws that hold the cabinets in, um, the screening cans, um, actually become loose with um, power cycles of heat cooling down over many decades. It's often found that these screws are loose, but uh, on this it seems fairly fairly solid, I must admit. But we'll take them out and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a look at the circuit boards, because there is a capacitor known issue in these on one of the boards, which is the 200 meg local oscillator, which is used in the RF SIG gen. It's a little electrolytic capacitor and there was a batch of these produced, uh, many thousands of them, that had this problem with the capacitor. And it's been on my channel before. If you have a look at the repair videos on the Marconi 2955, you will see that uh, we've done that repair before where there was a, a short circuit. This capacitor, although it's electrolytic cap, it goes dead short, which is unusual really for electrolytic caps to go dead short uh, without leaking. And this capacitor didn't have any signs of leaking so it's, uh, it's like a production fault or a solder bath problem as it's been heated up or whatever as part of the production but even new test sets were coming out like that and they had to be recalled for that repair doing but uh, not normally tantalum capacitors go dead short and burst into flames but this this was actually electrolytic cap I think it's a one mic at 50 volts or something off the top of my head but we'll see in a moment when we get in that there's definitely been issues with those on these. Uh, what it does, it's in series with a resistor, um, about a 10 ohm resistor or something that supplies um, plus 12 volt DC to the uh, oscillator circuit. So anything below around about, I think it's 80 megahertz, um, we'll look at the manual to verify, um, gets mixed with a 200 megahertz oscillator to then get frequencies down as low as 455 kilohertz. Uh, and I'll explain the frequency conversion shortly, but uh, once we remove these uh, these things, but the fault uh, that we used to see on these, obviously as well as the OM three four fives. Um, if I just find my little magnifier that I use to see things, um, there's a two hundred mega oscillator up here. That's the mixer and then you've got an oscillator here this uh, BFR 9091 I think it is transistor that's the amplifier and then you set the frequency of the 200 megahertz oscillator with that trimmer cap up there so let's see if I can get a bit more lighting on there so that trimmer cap sets the 200 megahertz it's a fixed frequency oscillator and your PLL for your 200 megahertz oscillator is formed by these three chips and it mixes with the RF. The RF comes in from the main three oscillators here. It comes in on this track amplified and this bridge, RF bridge track into here before then it gets routed through uh, pin diodes. So if you select an RF gem frequency above, I think it's 80 megahertz, then the RF gets passed straight through and amplified and out. And down here is the SIG gen's output to the stepped attenuator. Or alternatively, sub 200 megahertz or sub 80 megahertz rather. What it does is it routes it via this mixer, and then the 200 megahertz oscillator is switched on by one of these transistors down here, and uh, it's this capacitor which goes uh, short circuit. This one, this is in line with the um, power to the oscillator, and uh, it's what well, I think it's this transistor and this this resistor it starts to smoke or it gets very hot. Uh, luckily, it never seems to blow the transistor. It doesn't go fizz bang like these normally do, and the resistor never burns out. It just gets quite hot and it doesn't doesn't work. And it's this uh, electrolytic cap that's that's common. So we'll probably change both these electrolytic caps now, and possibly this one, because I think I only on some test sets. That's a different value to the other two, and it's a small Philips one. So as the models progressed, uh, the capacitor size that they actually fit is something like these here, uh, in place of that. And on other models, it's these, all three, the same value and same size, I believe. 
Um, so we'll definitely change that um, because that is definitely a common fault on them. Um, so look out for that. And the other one as well is loose screws actually on the board that hold them in. Uh, these pillars are okay and these, the screws were quite tight as they were taking them off. Um, same with the, the bolts that hold these on. Sometimes these can be a little bit loose. So tighten them up with a nut spinner and then obviously uh, it'll reduce uh, microphony, you know, microphonic effects and uh, then it'll help with that. Um, there's a ground shield there that looks a bit offline but it's it's okay. Um, but yeah, I mean it may not be affected on this production run. There's only a certain batch of them that had it, but I'd had quite a few of them over the years. So yeah, we'll see what uh, what else there could be. Obviously, uh, there's this upper RF can as well, and um, the screws on this are, are quite tight. So I'm not particularly worried about that situation that. Uh, we sometimes get on them. I've had them where they've just been finger tight, you know, they've been loose, uh, half backed off. Um, I've certainly had that over the years. But this this test set looks pretty well well put together, to be honest with you. Um, but it's always worth changing that cap anyway down there because if it goes short circuit, it'll stop your 200 megahertz oscillator. Basically, it'll fail tests on everything below 80 megahertz. So it's going through the self-test routine and it does a 20 megahertz uh, ranges, etc. Which it does as part of a self-test. It'll fail on about half a dozen tests and uh, it won't be able to um, return a pass result. And that's because of that. So it's always worth checking that. And we'll, uh, we'll show you that in the diagram in a moment where that is. But it took me a while to find it originally because, as I say, you don't normally get uh, electrolytic capacitors that are actually go short circuit it's quite rare is that i'm not saying it can't happen because obviously it does but it's certainly an odd one uh, on me is that one so we'll just leave that top uh, screw in there holding that can on and i think that one's off already and we'll just two more and then fall in or three if you count that one at the top and likewise, when you're putting them back, you don't need to over tighten them, just tighten them up. You know, it's not Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're not going to strip the threads on them, that kind of thing. They just need to be, be tight, but not over tight. Right, off it comes. So, uh, this is a frequency counter board here. Um, so, RF coming in from this connector here goes through the pi attenuators. But it's, switched in by this Teledyne relay. Uh, we've got the frequency counter IC and the data bus output, which goes off to the controller. And then RS pass through this chain, then this attenuator. So if the RF level coming in on the one watt port, the 20 or the uh, 75 watt port is too high for the measurement to take place, this step attenuator clicks in and uh, reduces the RF level. Uh, then the RS transposed across this contact, into board contact, into here, where it's attenuated again via this pin diode switch before it's passed into the, what is the D-mod board? So the D-mod board's job is to demodulate from this signal coming in direct, uh, the RS signal that's presented at the uh, tie pen on the, on the front, or the BNC. Um, it demodulates AM, FM and phase modulation. So you've got separate demodulators on this board. And then there's an IF derived from this, which is then sent off then on one of these two connectors. I can't remember which. There's one that's an IF connection that goes to the back of a unit. There's a BNC on the rear of the uh, 2955, so you can connect off spectrum analyzers and things like that there. Uh, or other devices and then the other one goes off then to the measuring section which is the vertical boards at the top and one of the vertical boards has a power meter measurement on it so the way that the RF power is measured on these is through the um, IF signal um, most radio test sets including the Rode and Swartz, Agilent uh, and other brands of radio test set use a Schottky diode across the actual RF power attenuator after the 20 dB pad as the RF power comes in um, the other side of the 20 dB pad there's a, a Schottky diode and a smoothing capacitor and that's how the Roden Swartz CMS tests work 
So they read an RF voltage, a rectified RF voltage. It's directly proportional to the RF coming in. Uh, fed through op amps and then obviously linearized and sent off to a um, microcontroller where it's read uh, and displayed on the test set. Whereas Marconi do it differently. They, they chose to take the IF signal itself and then use the IF power um, to actually calculate the, the RF power. Um, so it's done differently on the Marconi's. Um, so yeah, basically that's the frequency counter board. Uh, this is the demodulator board for AM, FM and phase mod. And then this here is the synthesizer board, this one down here, with the three um, VCOs on them and the synthesizer PLL circuits. So these will change frequency as we input different frequencies on the front. And then the SIGGEN amplifier board is this. So the output stage of the SIGGEN is all on this section. And the 200 megahertz fixed frequency local oscillator for making frequencies below 80 megahertz. Um, so that's that part of it. Um, now, when we turn it round, that's the RF tray, obviously. Um, so you can see there isn't another board on the back of this. It's just the motherboard where the vertical modules go in. The power supply is on the under, underneath section, which we're going to have a look at next and uh, see what condition that's in. Yeah, so this is a capacitor there. It is actually a slightly different capacitor to the uh, other video I did because that um, other test set was from a different production run. Um, so I've just verified that it's uh, it is a, it's a bit different that, but we will replace it. Uh, but as you can see, um, the main thing as well with these is the OM345 hybrid amps. Uh, there's a few of them on this one um, dotted about, you'll find. But uh, these OM345s are actually quite troublesome. And they're, uh, they're found all over the instrument, basically. There's this one here in this uh, RF section. And then I believe there's some more somewhere. The OM360 down here is the final output amplifier and uh, that amplifies up significantly higher in gain than the ON345 modules does the ON360. It's got a higher uh, output. But uh, again even on the even on the um, frequency counter board we've got two ON345s there and um, they they get about uh, there's an ON370 and ON360 uh, as well that's used in them actually come to think of it and that's what this is so in 370 and 360s um hybrid amps as well as on 345s that dotted all over the place as you'll see but uh, that's just a little overview of that okay again on this side what we've got here we've got the input alpha attenuator pad that sits in here with the heat sink fins on bolted to the chassis uh, we've got the 20 db pad um, RF attenuator that connects to the Type N on the front and then we've got some low power resistors in there that are for the 1 watt port and uh, basically there are two uh, connections on that that you might be able to see in a moment when I turn it round uh, just a little bit so the top one which is this connection here uh, that one is for uh, the signal generator so as we can see here, we've got the output of a step attenuator from the um, RF uh, attenuator control comes out and goes into the um, step, well, the, from the step attenuator into the RF attenuator. And then down at the bottom there, that smaller connection right down at the bottom, that's the actual TX, TX output that's attenuated from the output of this. Connects then obviously to the underside. Um, if you remember we're just looking at the frequency counter board it connects there and then it goes through the frequency counter board more attenuation be a relay and switched with pin diodes attenuation then onto the separate boards that we've just gone through earlier but uh, in order for it to do a duplex what happens is the uh, RF input here has to be 20 dBs higher than the expected output going to the front socket and obviously then the TX power coming in at the same time if we're say in duplex mode gets attenuated down in the um, RF attenuator module and what that does then is it uh, 
is two things one the level is too low coming out of here back into the um the step attenuator that it can't cause damage to this or cause damage to the receiver uh well the rf signal generators final output stages so the level of rf coming back the other way on this coaxial cable is so low it's not going to cause any issues and likewise as well the uh, the other socket down there essentially connects off then to the TX monitor side of the of the system so it can work in duplex that way through resistive and 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 this is a resistive duplex in a way whereas um, most radio engineers are conversant with base stations like Hilltop radio sites that use filters as duplexes but obviously this test set has to work between you know a few hundred kilohertz to one gigahertz so it can't use um, physical cavity filters to separate the TX and RX paths it uses a resistive attenuator instead. All that means is the output coming out of here has to be a lot higher than what we need going out through the, the top of it, which is this connector here that goes off. There are two connectors, one for the BNC and one for the tie pen, which is this coax here. So that's how it divides the power down. It brings the powers down both on transmit and receive. It lowers everything by 20 dBs minimum and then it arrives uh, on the output then to be processed or also for a signal generator to be fed in. Uh, the step attenuator here doesn't vary the fine levels between steps. All this does is go in physical steps. So when we alter the veneer on the front, the, the variable control, um, the pin diodes on one of the boards I've just shown you are actually calibrated with a DAC value in the microcontrol that adjusts the DC level to the pin diodes up and down as we adjust the RF level up and down and the calibration data for that's held in the memory on the processor board here this particular board and then what happens is then is that those calibration values are always available when you turn the control and um, that means then between those physical steps the var variation of it is achieved when we then get to the next um, increment, if you like, of 10 dB, 20, 30, 40 dBs, whatever level we're going to, uh, a propanate solenoids in here are, are switched in in order to connect the, uh, the RF through at the right level. The level that's fed in here is more or less constant, give or take about 10 dBs, because the pin diode attenuator on the RF board well, has about a 10 dB or 20 dB range on it. So it can only alter it within that range, that limit, and then the next thing you know, uh, that clicks in another step, and then again it can alter it another 10 dBs, 20 dBs, then it clicks in again, uh, and then we keep going down or up in level in steps while this makes up for the little differences in between. So this level coming in here is very high, it's um, a very high level indeed. Um, and, but then we have all these system losses, so we have the step attenuator attenuate it massively and then when the step attenuator is finished with it then the um, the power attenuator here the pi attenuator again reduces it by another 20 db before it's then led out to the front socket so that's a little rundown of that now we've got a processor card we've got the analog cards we've got all sorts of different cards in here that do the measurement the oscilloscope um, again the tx power measurement um, again, it's all calibrated on the memory and the RAM, but also we've got potentiometers as well as per the service manual that we can uh, we can adjust to set levels precisely if we want to. Uh, there's a loudspeaker there, and on the CRT, one of the other common problems that we get on these, um, that's a GPIB board at the bottom there, but one of the other problems that we get on these is the uh, line output transformer that just sits here. And unfortunately, they go short circuit on the um, on on the primary coil, and the switching transistor that you can just see there mounted on the board that uh, TO220 package device effectively goes fizz bang um, because the primary coil's dead short. Uh, there were retrofit kits for these, and I think they're still available to some degree, but uh, very hard to get hold of now. Are the line output transformers for these? And there were two variants of them made. Um, so you had to have like an adapter board and all that faffing about when you when you replace them. Uh, this module down here, this this silver module, and I'll just try and zoom in a bit. Uh, this thing that's just sat behind this ribbon, 
down there. That is the 10 megahertz, um, I think it's 10 megahertz anyway. Uh, yes, it's 10 megahertz and that, that is the, the time base, is that for the unit. So that's where the actual time base comes from uh, for the test set. So if you're using the internal reference, then that's what is adjusted by this potentiometer just there, this blue potentiometer. And so that basically can set the time base, frequency accuracy of the test instrument. So that's part of the calibration routine. Uh, these potentiometers at the top here set the horizontal and vertical spread, if you like, on the CRT. And then the um, horizontal positioning is the, the other pot. Um, so they can be hypersensitive. I've adjusted those already off camera because you've only to breathe on them and the, the picture was going a bit erratic. And if you touch the potentiometers like pressing on them with your finger, it also um, started to do strange things. So it was down to the uh, wipers in the potentiometers um, having crud on them. So I've just given them a, a bit of a spray and a twiddle and they're, uh, they're okay. And there's no further adjustment needed with the CRT tube uh, as well, which is there. Now, there is um, underneath this uh, can there, the anode cap that goes onto the uh, CRT tube as well, uh, which you can't see. And then obviously there's the um, end here for the guns uh, for the CRT there as well on that board. Uh, the heaters on these are 12 volt heaters and they run directly from the... 12 volt supply to the um, to the um, line output transformer board so there's that there is um, quite a large electrolytic capacitor down there as well which has never ever gone wrong as far as I'm aware on any of these uh, these test instruments um, now right down here at the back just behind this GPIB board you might just be able to see what looks to be like a donut shaped device down there that's the toroidal transformer, and with it, uh, next to it, which is quite hard to see, you can probably see more of the toroidal transformer there, look. So that's the toroidal transformer. Next to it, um, you might just be able to get a little bit of blue that's just next to it down there, where my finger is. That's the electrolytic smoothing capacitor that's laid horizontally on the back and bracketed in. And just beneath that, which you'd have to sadly remove the back of a test set in order to see it uh, is a bridge rectifier that's bolted to the chassis uh, the rear panel so then the uh, rectified DC voltage which is a low voltage I think it's about 30 volts something like that that then goes off to the power supply module which lives in the in the bottom here in this can which we're going to remove next and have a look in there yeah so we've got the back off now and as you can see, it's pretty man manky. We're going to have to, uh, we'll take this off shortly and have a look. But you've got the pl plenty of blackness on there and dust and, and soot. So we're going to have to vacuum it, I think. So we've got our dusty Dyson. And give it a vac. Because it certainly needs it. Could do with a bit of a clean. It's probably not being cleaned as a... 40 years, so give it a bit of a brush. Right, okay, here we go. Let's go away. a bit of a, a brush.
bench is full of it now. Oh. got a few uh, bits and bobs now that's interesting because uh, that's dropped out from somewhere as that so I we'll have to find out where that went but uh, that wasn't there before so that seems to have come out the, uh, the back of there so I think that might have been something that's uh, been in it a while but we'll uh, we'll check on that because I know where that screw would go if it uh, does belong in here I'll just back up the bench Right, so now we can gently put that down again and then remove the screws for this and uh, so when you get the right screwdriver they're nice and tight, not bad we've got some new filters here that we'll be able to fit as well onto the uh, onto the unit and uh, I should sort it out we'll just check the power supply because the way this this particular unit works is that it has a, a little switch mode power supply that runs off a low voltage and it's so that you can connect a, a battery to that connector there uh, basically as it says uh, quite a low voltage up to about 30 odd volts input so you can run it from a vehicle battery you see and they did uh, an option on this which will be on my youtube channel which is a, a battery pack uh, that piggybacked onto them and it can charge through this connector as well can the NICAD battery pack as well as being able to be powered externally from an external DC power supply um, so yeah pretty good so that gets fed into what's an inverter in here uh, and as I said earlier the uh, the mains power supply is on the other side of the toroidal transform you see that's that's pretty dirty I'm gonna have to back that out um, but it comes in here does the mains uh, step down rectified DC low voltage supply it's about 30 something volts it comes in and it gets switched by this relay that's just underneath so we just have a look a bit further there and come in a bit so this relay underneath here uh, does all that switching between the DC connector here uh, which is the one where the battery connects to our external supply so it switches between internal power external uh, and then what happens is then uh, we've got some IRF540 transistors on the back here. Um, one of them's a rectifier diode and the other two are IRF540 FETs that switch, uh, that are pulse width modulated as you would have in a switch mode power supply. And that's the time base I see there. And then the actual main transformer for running the entire unit and all its power supplies is actually this. Uh, this is the main transformer here and that then feeds all these rectifiers that are underneath and these wires here are your plus 5 volt, 12 volt, minus 15, so on and so forth voltage that go off to run the actual unit potentiometers set the um, limits as well uh, down here, the voltages and there's a couple of faults with these power supplies that we've detailed on the on the channel um, you do get problems with the IRF 540s, uh, the um, insulating washers, they get very hot and uh, these have got the silicon rubber mats on them but sometimes the um, bolts that hold them in for some reason have been loose or whatever and the, the transistor starts to get super hot and the plastic washer that insulates the nuts melts and so... Uh, when they melt, uh, then they short out, because obviously they're meant to be insulated. Uh, that's the current transformer that measures the current consumption of the uh, supply. 
So if it goes over a certain current that, then it triggers the power supply to shut down. And uh, these inductors here, this inductor and that inductor are actually smoothing inductors along with this. So L1, L2 and whatever L number that is. And these diodes here are the rectifier diodes along with these here, these two. Um, but more the, the main faults you get with these are these IRF 540s packing. Uh, I can't say I've had any transformer failures, but I've certainly had the diodes fail. And the, uh, the IRF 540s tend to be the main common thing. I've never had a toroidal transformer fail, and I've never had a smoothing capacitor or bridge rectifier fail on them yet. And they are genuinely quite reliable, providing, of course, the dusted out and uh, and kept nice and clean. And then uh, Zener diodes, I've had a couple of Zener diodes blow on these. But uh, quite easy to repair, really. Not bad at all. Little power supply. And uh, just needs a vac. Uh, another vacuum, I think. So we'll do that now. <laughs> So, um, that's about it really with the power supply section. Fans are generally okay. I don't really get any complaints of noisy bearings, but I've got plenty of spares of those. So we'll just put some new filters in the PSU cover. Okay, so we've got this board out and uh, out the test set now. Now, I know what people are going to say, why don't we place all the capacitors on the board? But the fact of the matter is, it's only this capacitor that ever fails. None of the other caps ever fail. It was something to do, um, I believe, with the manufacturing process that caused the fault. Um, but I could be wrong. But I know that every other Marconi I've ever repaired, uh, the other caps have been fine on this board. It's just this one that fails. Now, there's a transistor just there, which output is fed via that resistor and then to this capacitor and then on to the oscillator. It's a minus voltage uh, that it, it conducts because the minus side of the capacitor goes down to the printed foil side for the ground path so that resistor there um, starts getting hot um, and obviously it can't supply the the power then to the um, 200 megahertz oscillator so we're going to remove that i've got another capacitor that's almost identical to it different manufacturer same value and voltage so we're going to fit that in there and then um, Bob's your uncle, but uh, yeah, back soon. Okay, so we've uh, changed that now. We'll just trim these wires off and uh, make it a nice tidy job. So, I'll just go to here. So that's that replaced, thank goodness. Nice new capacitor installed, ready for use. Okay, lovely. Well, we've got the board back in now and everything. And um, we're ready to reassemble the casing back now, back to where it should be after doing final checks when we've reassembled that board and connected the RF coaxial cable up there. Everything's all back where it should be. Now we replace this capacitor. So we'll uh, reassemble it and uh, then do some final tests just to make sure that... Uh, you know, we'll have to go through all the calibration tests and everything following this uh, to make sure that all the specification um, is as it should be. So, we'll uh, we put some uh, new filters in. There's one more to do at the bottom there. All nice new filters being installed. So, it's just a case of uh, reassembly and then uh, that's it then. Should be able to uh, give it a... A full comprehensive cal test 
Oh, and just while I forget as well, that screw that we found, the additional one that dropped out, um, it's actually came out of the back of this unit. Now, what it is, there's a, a post which goes that deep for the, the case bottom, if you like, the power supply section here. And there's two screws on the back that go into uh, two posts. Well, the other end of the post to the chassis is held on with a little screw just down here and then another screw on that side uh, that fastens the post to the rear casing and what had happened is when we were unscrewing the the post uh, the screw at the back of this panel for releasing this panel from these two posts that hold it the post itself has started turning round and unscrewed itself from the fastener in here so that's the screw that dropped out so I put the screw back in fastened the post and tightened it up so when we put this bottom panel on, uh, the two screws that go through um, into the post then won't turn the, the physical post around, which it was doing before it was quite loose. So that explains where that screw came from. Okay, we'll just have a look at this circuit diagram then to describe this oscillator where we've made the capacitor change. So here we've got a DC switch, and when we select a frequency range between uh, 400 kilohertz to 88 megahertz then basically this signal gets fed in here to bias this transistor on so we have a minus 12 volt supply coming in through this PMP transistor and it's outputted through this uh, 22 ohm resistor uh, that then in turn comes along this line and hits this one nanofarad capacitor uh, but just off the screen uh, almost uh, when we take a look just off the screen is this capacitor here. Ignore this, this has nothing to do with it. This is just a line that crosses over for something else. So it's this one nanofarad and then this capacitor we've just replaced here, uh, which is there. Now that feeds uh, this oscillator, this line. It feeds this oscillator here, which is a 200 megahertz fixed frequency oscillator. It's basically a free running oscillator. It's like a Colpitz oscillator. It's just running free and then it's netted, it's controlled by a varactor diode which is a DC control voltage fed to it from a, uh, a loop filter and then before that a phase lock loop, a divider, phase comparator. So I'll explain that now, how that runs, but basically top and bottom of it is um, this 200 megahertz oscillator is powered by that circuit. So if this capacitor goes short circuit, this uh, 220 mic that's down here um, then on near short circuit it, it flattens this supply rail on there causes this resistor to heat up or burn and this transistor to go fizz bang um, but what happens is is that the output of a 200 mega oscillator free running oscillator um, its output RF output is sampled it's fed out on the collector and it comes back along and it goes into what is this divider divide by uh, I think it's 20 so this divides the frequency down and then it gets buffered and fed into another divider um, which which then provides if you like a 5 megahertz or approximate 5 megahertz signal depending on what this oscillator is doing frequency wise but it's gone high maybe 210 220 megahertz maybe 250 megs whatever because of a fault condition or temperature changes. Um, obviously, as you know, oscillators will change frequency when the temperature alters because the physical characteristics of the components change and thus the frequency drifts with temperature. So as that frequency drifts that's coming in, that 200 mega, and it gets divided down, right down to five megahertz. That five megahertz might not be five megahertz. It might be six, seven megahertz. It might be five and a half megahertz. It might be 5.1 megahertz. Whatever that, whatever frequency it is, comes in here on the bottom of this into this phase comparator. However, if we look here, we've got a time base from here, uh, which comes in, which is a 10 megahertz stable time base from the reference oscillator in the instrument. That's the calibrated frequency standard that comes in. Again, it gets divided down to 5 megahertz. So we've divided the 10 megs to 5, and we've divided the 200 megahertz to nearly 5 megahertz. Now, if the oscillator here is running bang on 200 megahertz, this phase comparator doesn't need to make any adjustments. 
However, if the oscillator here starts to drift off frequency due to temperature characteristics, changes in temperature, etc., then the output frequency starts to move one way or the other. It could go higher, it could go lower, depending on temperatures. So ultimately, the frequency that arrives here for comparison with the reference, the stable temperature control reference oscillator input, that in itself is a, is a very rock-solid signal. So it will compare the two together. So any difference here in frequency, because ultimately this oscillator is drifting away, um, it will then compare the two. And what it will do at that point, it will make a decision. It will say, right, one of the inputs, uh, non-inverting versus the inverted input, is changing its state, its frequency, uh, from the other. So therefore, I will then produce an output voltage. There's a pull-up resistor here to uh, plus 5 volts or whatever. Uh, and this voltage then is dampened by this RC network and the voltage will either rise or fall in synergy with the differences across these inverting and non-inverting inputs. That in turn, the DC control voltage will be fed to this part of the circuit where there's a varactor diode, a variable capacitance diode. And so by changing the DC conditions to this diode will change its capacitance in the circuit and thus the oscillator will start to change its frequency and ultimately it will start to go to 200 megahertz. The closer it gets to 200 megahertz coming back and divided down to 5 megahertz, as the frequency gets closer to 5 megahertz, the control voltage begins to stabilize, its rate of change declines. However, if the oscillator starts to wildly go off frequency because you bring your, your hand close to the circuit, or it suddenly gets quite warm, or it changes its characteristics again, and it starts to wander off frequency, either higher or lower, the rate of change here changes markedly quick, and thus the output of this changes markedly quick, and the voltage control to this varactor diode changes again quite quickly to try and pull this in. Now there comes a point um, when this oscillator might go too far off frequency, no matter what voltage between 0 to 5 volts is applied here, it might not be able to bring the oscillator back onto frequency or near enough for this to be able to control it. So how it's achieved in that, in that case is that part of the alignment procedure, you get the oscillator to free run without the PLL, so in other words you'd essentially um, lift this capacitor out of circuit, you then adjust, put a frequency in below 88 megahertz, so it switches on this oscillator for a start off. And then what you do then is you adjust this trimmer capacitor, which I pointed out on the circuit board earlier. And you use a spectrum analyzer frequency count on the output of this oscillator to pull in the oscillator as close as you can to 200 megahertz. Now, it'll be very sensitive with this capacitor, but that's basically what you do. You try and get tune, as it's highlighted there, tune. You tune the oscillator uh, to as near as damn it 200 megahertz. And then you reinstate this capacitance. And then, basically, the signal then that's coming back is nearly 200 megahertz. So it's within the capture range of this uh, divider and phase comparator. Thus, if the two signals are near in phase, in, or in other words, near in similar frequencies, then the output will be controllable. Um, so you're bringing it, the oscillator within the capture range of the phase lock loop, if you like. Now, most radio equipment, PLLs and synthesizers are totally different. Uh, they, they have what's called a loop filter on the output, the phase comparator, and it has pulse width modulation pulses. So depending whether the VCO is going high or low in frequency, um, the PWM, the pulse width modulation, will change mark space ratio, and the loop filter, the RC network, will convert the signal from square waves of differing mark space ratio to um, a steady DC voltage. And that voltage can go minus voltage as well as to zero, and then to plus territory, and then back again. So. VCOs tend to have what's called capture range, big capture ranges, so they've got a big tuning range on voltage controlled oscillators. So if this thing just wanders off tens of megahertz or maybe hundreds of megahertz, this circuit can still grab hold of it and capture it and alter the tuning on the oscillator to pull it back into lock. 
Now, when the both signals are, are, are in lock, in other words, when the output's 200 megahertz and it's compared here, and the both signals on this comparative five megahertz each, then that's what's called a state of lock. A state of unlock occurs when the oscillator wanders off frequency too far for this to be able to grab hold of it, and thus there'll be a, an out of lock state. And in most synthesizing VCOs, they'll have a lock detect and out of lock line that goes off to a micro computer. Um, so unlike PMR radios, amateur radio transceivers, things like that, it'll say synthesizer out of lock on the display, or it'll give a, a mating call like a beep beep beep, or some warning indicator to let you know that the PLL's out of lock. Or there'll be an LED on the board that'll glow red when it's in lock and not glow at all when it's out of lock. And that, that's the sign for the engineer to tune it. So um, there's all sorts of weird things. Obviously, radios that have programmable dividers, prescalers, and synthesizers are where you can change the frequency of the oscillator because you could have a radio that's frequency controlled like a VFO or it's channelized. So you get more complicated versions of synthesizers and, v and, and PLLs. But this is a basic form of phase lock loop. Um, not the most advanced, but it's it's a good comparison. So if this capacitor goes uh, short circuit, then basically it stuffs it. Now beyond this um, oscillator, there's a buffer amp, and we can look at that on the next diagram uh, to explain how that works. But basically the buffer amp itself uh, is here. So that 200 megahertz signal makes its way to the base of this NPN transistor, which is a a BFR90 low noise uh, UHF transistor. That supply rail is there going in. That's that capacitor we replaced, which is on that other diagram, just on the edge. So it supplies power to this device. Uh, we've got a plus voltage of plus 12 volts there, and then we're obviously feeding a, a minus 12 volt signal in here on the emitter. This then buffers the output level, RF level, to increase its level and it's fed then this 200 megahertz fixed frequency to the double balance mixer, this DBM. This is the silver can on the circuit board. Now, when we enter a frequency in of uh, 400 kilohertz to 88 megahertz on the front of the test set, what it does, because it doesn't have an oscillator within it that generates a frequency in that range, it uses a mixing process here. So we have um, an oscillator within the unit that will um, will be at, um, for example, um, 88 megahertz to 165 megahertz, and that basically switched on. So we'd have a frequency coming in here, uh, and then that would mix them with the 200 megahertz signal applied here. So the signal from this oscillator's buffered output would come down, mixing the mixer with the 200 megahertz fixed frequency. So this is like a VFO, this frequency can change higher or lower, go anywhere from um, 88 MHz or whatever up to 165 MHz. And this is a fixed frequency here. So the two collide in here, get mixed, and then the output of the mixer is on here. So this then is a frequency range of 0 0.4 400 kHz to 88 MHz is present along there. Uh, any frequency above 88 megahertz, then the, the path carries on straight across here. So between 88 to 165 megahertz, it comes out and goes that way. If you notice, we've got pin diodes here, which switch the RF path for different things. And again, another pin diode there. for the So basically from 400 kilohertz to 165 megahertz is all dealt with in, in this area here. And then the um, other oscillator, which is 165 to 1000 megahertz, comes along this line and then it's fed straight away through these pin diodes and out that way. So that is how that works. It's done through a, a state of mixing um, and that's how it, how it works. So it mixes with a 200 megahertz signal um, to then produce a difference which ultimately ends up either in 400 kilohertz to 88 megahertz. So that's how it works. Interesting. Anyway, so far as the keypad faults concerned with the uh, metal bracket that uh, is for the fascia plate on the radio test set, um, the screw 
becoming loose which is quite a common fault on these test sets actually I've found over the years the screws that hold the keypad board in um, become loose and it's obviously many decades of the heat heating up and cooling down cycles and then combined with physical stress exerted on the board by the uh, pressing of the keys and it causes the screws to become loose and ultimately they can drop off and I've found that with some uh, test equipment I've had for repair in the past it doesn't happen a lot but um, the screws certainly become loose and the board then uh, indents uh, to places where it shouldn't do um, so if we look at the um, the keyboard in more detail uh, with the keys as we see them set out there um, you may have noticed at the start of the video we had the LEDs which signify AM and FM illuminated at the same time which I straight away could tell there was something not right there um, when you see the AM and FM lights illuminated simultaneously that's a good indication that there's something electronically wrong so that was something that I, I sort of um, subconsciously saw and uh, then when we delved in deeper obviously the uh, the keys for the um, TXRX uh, which are obviously uh, these two here um, the bracket is just above and it had swung down and was touching the contacts at the back of the uh, TX button so when you press the TX switch on the test set um, then it was interrupting that and it was didn't show itself all the time the fault because obviously if a test sets uh, on its stand tilted upwards the bracket would sort of swing away from the board but if a test set was uh, moved about or if it was disturbed or perhaps it was level on a bench because the handle was put over the top of the test set then that uh, bracket could quite easily swing down and touch these electrical connections on the back and ultimately would link one of the rows and one column together um, and uh, so obviously all these keys would be coming operable um, so that that was that really and uh, causing all kinds of, uh, of issues with the multiplex of a keypad and not being able to uh, to work and that was one of the complaints that uh, um, the owner said that there was with the test set so that's a little insight into that okay so now we're ready to do some signal generator checks um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the microwave radio test set uh, which is over here which goes up to 46 gigahertz the reason why I'm using this instrument is because it's highly accurate this particular instrument has a frequency range of 10 megahertz to 46 gigahertz it's a vector network analyzer and it's also um, connected to an atomic frequency standard and a GPS reference as well so they're both synchronized into that unit so therefore that is as accurate as you can get with regards to frequency accuracy um, so two things we're going to measure on this instrument we're going to measure um, the into the frequency count on the silver cable here um, the frequency accuracy of the instrument which we're currently looking at now and then this other connector which is on this side is a power sensor uh, which is this which we've just been through the calibration procedure on this uh, with the instrument for its own internal calibration mechanism and we've inputted the data on this uh, table with the cal factor and linearity data so that we know that this sensor is going to be working correctly and measuring properly uh, and calibrated to zero dBm on the cal feature on the Marconi so we're currently connected into the RF output of the uh, Marconi to a 955 we're connecting the RF output up to the on this cable to the counter input we select a frequency count at 1 Hz resolution and we're breaking that screen out now onto uh, this screen here and as we can see there we're getting at 1 Hz resolution uh, we're actually getting quite good frequency accuracy there and uh, there's no need for any adjustments with that it's spot on there's nothing wrong with that uh, tester set now if I change the frequency to 300 megahertz for example uh, we're just going to move that now 300 megahertz and then I'll do 600 megahertz so as you can see um, very accurate indeed 600 megahertz 
we've got 600 megahertz signal there and then a 1 gigahertz signal 1000 megahertz and then uh, we should be getting that there look so very accurate indeed there's no point in trying to uh, adjust that because it's so accurate as it is now it's well within its uh, specification for frequency accuracy I mean, you're not going to be able to get it any finer than that uh, with drift and everything else with temperature so um, yeah there's nothing wrong with that so what we'll do now we'll move over to the uh, the scalar uh, function so I'll just go back here uh, it's we'll over to power meter and uh, now we're on power meter so what I can do I can disconnect uh, this coaxial cable and then we will connect up the power sensor head to the uh, Marconi see if we can get it to go on that's it okay so we're currently on uh, one gigahertz at uh, minus 30 dBm as we can see there one gigahertz at minus 30 dBm and then if I just show you there look the level it's very accurate is that minus 28.6 dBm um, if we do um, frequency 500 megahertz just change it to 500 megahertz now well let's keep in the same level 300 megahertz 100 megahertz and then 50 megahertz doing okay there nothing wrong with that um, if I just increase the level to minus 20 dBm and now we're uh, just letting the the Marconi settle with the measurement so not going too bad this particular sensor measures down to about neg 35 dBm uh, then I have other sensors that are more sensitive that measure further but um, this is just a, an indication of where we are with the uh, RF level so we've set the uh, Marconi to uh, minus 20 dBm and uh, we're currently getting a, a nice minus 19.82 so it's literally um, you know 0.2 of a dB off it's uh, very accurate is that across all the frequency ranges um, so yeah nothing wrong with that um, at all There's nothing wrong with that at all uh, if I put like minus 25 dBm in uh, it's, uh, it's got a good accuracy there we'll also do some tests with the spectrum analyzer as well throughout the switchable ranges in the attenuator because with quite a high level at the moment so I want to see that um, decrement all the way through its ranges right the way down to you know neg 100 dBm at least uh, just to check its all the relay uh, ranges on the RF variable attenuator work but uh, there's nothing wrong with that I mean as you can see there so there's no adjustment required um, in so far as frequency or RF level output is concerned nothing at all um, so yeah I think uh, you can also change the averaging and uh, input D on DB resolution So, yeah, nothing wrong with that. Nothing 
nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, I'm just looking at some of the uh, the options with it. So again, if we change the, um, the sort of frequency, so if I do IFGM frequency, 500 megahertz. And again, you can see the the level is only changing marginally. Um, 800 megahertz. And 1000 megahertz. So there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So the next measurements we'll do will be to check the switch attenuator ranges. Uh, then we will check the um, modulation standard as well for AM and FM and phase modulation. We'll look at that and then we'll do some transmit power measurements into the unit. To check its um, power measurement capability and uh, we'll go from there they're the next ones right well we're now going to do some um, signal generator checks on the one watt bnc port both in simplex and duplex to check that because the reason why we do that is because depending whether the test is in duplex mode or in simplex mode means we get different relay configurations on the uh, RF attenuator section but we also um, need to check the 1 watt port for damage because we also get uh, chances here that the RF power has been um, exceeded on the 1 watt port now to explain the RF attenuator that sits within the unit which we're going to later uh, module gets the connections from both the sockets the type N however has got a 30 dB pad uh, in line with it, a substrate resistor which is bolted down to the heat sink and this can take a couple hundred watts peak even though it's rated at 75 watt max you'll see in the manual it's rated 250 watts or thereabouts peak um, so it's much harder to damage the type N port than it is to damage the BNC the BNC doesn't have its own um, substrate pi attenuator that's bolted to the heat sink it's basically made up of um, normal resistors uh, which are um, not bolted to a heat sink and are susceptible then to burning out if you put too much RF in there and quite often um, people connect um, too high a power to this port and burn those resistors now they can burn them a little bit which then means that the pi attenuator because three of them uh, in circuit they can burn where they alter the value and thus the attenuation changes or alternatively could be burned out completely and they'll not work um, so what we're going to do is we're going to repeat the test that we did on the end port but this time on the BNC but this time we're also going to um, put it into duplex mode as well so how we do that is we connect our uh, power probe up to the uh, the sensor with the BNC 10 adapter connect it now onto the BNC and then what we're going to do, we're going to uh, we're putting a minus 15 dBm signal in at the moment. And as you can see there, we're getting uh, neg 15 dBm on the uh, scale of probe. Now if I increase that for this uh, power sensor rather and put it to 0 dBm, obviously yeah, we're getting very accurate power. We're talking only 0.3 of a dB off which is well within specification and then to plus 5 dBm notice the BNC port has a different output level maximum on it than what the end port um, can provide and that's built into the design of the test set uh, now if I go to duplex so this time what we're going to do is we're going to test the relay configuration since this test set can operate in both single port and dual port duplex um, so if we're in duplex mode, single port, both the transmitting receiver is on the end, end port. However, if we press this button here, then we get the BNC as signified there on the receiver, on the SIG gen, and the transmitter on the end port. So what we're going to do now, now that we're in, in split port mode or in duplex mode, um, we're then going to increase this signal level back up to above neg. 30 dBm so that we're in the dynamic range 
of the um, sensor and so we're at minus 15.1 dBm and as we can see there reading minus 15.27 so that's where we're at there look and uh, so hopefully you can see that on the screen so we've got the level measured there and obviously outputting that so if we then decrease the level again like we were be before to minus 20 dBm and again check the level on there uh, we're getting minus 20 dBm and uh, let's just decrease it now to minus 30 dBm and again we're coming right down to the bottom end of a dynamic range of this particular sensor and uh, so it should still read and it takes a little while longer for it to settle because obviously it's a very accurate measurement so we just need to give it time just to settle down but uh, again you know we're talking uh, quite an accurate level there you know fractions of a db off roughly so i ain't going to complain about that we're right at the bottom end of that uh, usable dynamic range now on that sensor so um i can't find anything wrong with that the test frequency that we're using here is 300 megahertz um whereas before it was obviously at one gigahertz we can set the rfgm frequency to 1000 megahertz still and uh, we're still getting that level accuracy as well at minus 15.52 dbm uh, if i set minus 25 dbm again we're getting that minus 25 db accuracy minus 30 oops minus 30 dbm and then again it'll read right the way down to about neg 34 neg 35 so this is where we get with these messages coming up because of the fact that the uh, the radio test set is so sensitive and accurate to even with temperature variations that it needs period cal as we go through some of these measurements um, but this is obviously to be expected when you're, you're talking at this level of calibration so okay so I'm happy with that uh, very happy indeed um, I can't see any problems there at all uh, with those ranges so again we'll check this on the spectrum analyzer as well um, when we get down to obviously testing that uh, throughout the RF levels over the entire dynamic range of the RF attenuator, the step attenuator. Now if we've got a single port duplex, the transmitter monitor with the RF level mount to maximum should pick itself up and so we should be able to hear the mod as well and we can. So basically to explain uh, the signal generator is outputting the highest level it can on the type n port and the transmitter monitor which is also on the same port is picking itself up so basically it's testing that the uh, modulation content and everything's there um, but we're going to check the mods separately anyway uh, both for am fm and uh, we'll check that against uh, another test instrument here which has been calibrated and we'll also do tx power measurements into the ports as well to make sure that the TX power readings are accurate on the uh, on the instrument as well but so far so good it seems quite stable in frequency quite stable in RF level from what we've seen so far but we'll need to verify that with the the lower ranges of the step attenuator on both VN and the BNC port and uh, then we'll have to do some transmitter measurements obviously and with the modulation content uh, the F input for the cyanide reading and again the F gen output to make sure that the F output is outputting the correct audio waveforms and shapes and uh, make sure that they they're all operating fully and, and working so onwards and upwards okay so in this next measurement what I'm wanting to do is check the step attenuator ranges within the instrument so we're going to do this measurement on all RF ranges right the way down uh, to roughly about neg 100 dBm using the spectrum analyzer and uh, then we're also once we've done these frequency measurements and level checks uh, throughout the step ranges of the RF attenuator and the variable uh, what we're going to do then is we're going to use another instrument 
which then has integral amplifiers in it that will measure beyond neg 100 dBm down to about neg 120, neg 130. And so we're going we're gonna to do that a bit later. But what I want to do is check the dynamic range of the instrument's usable RF level over its entire frequency range. So we're going to start the measurement putting a frequency in of 10 MHz. Uh, we're going to adjust the RF gen level at maximum so it can't go any higher which is minus 15 dBm on the end port and then what we're going to do we're going to introduce an increment of 1 dB steps which we've got there 1 dB so it means when we use the increment keys which are, uh, are these keys here these level keys then that will then automatically adjust the level and we can use the variable control as well and um, we're going to do that on 10 megahertz, 300 megahertz, um, 600 megahertz, and then 1 gigahertz. I'm going to check all the RF levels. So if we just zoom over now to the um, spectrum analyzer, which I've set up. Um, this is an Agilent um, spectrum analyzer, but it's actually a VSA series um, analyzer, E4406A. It does 7 megahertz to 4 gigahertz. This particular instrument uh, also does IQ waveforms as well for digital modes, but we're not going to be interested in that. So what I've done, I've selected the Spectrum Analyzer screen and we're zooming in on that at the moment. Um, so if I select uh, frequency 10 MHz and then we put the marker on and normal and then we whiz the marker over. You can do this measurement at zero span as well, but I always like to pull out the RF signal if I can. And then we can analyze that so what i've done normally the the tiny little peak of rf that you get within the entire um, spectral range i've pulled zoomed into that and then pulled it out so we can measure the signal we're not producing any modulation on the marcone it's just a blank carrier with no mod and that's what we're going to analyze now so we're currently injecting a signal in at uh, minus 15 dBm. It's worth to note that the cable that I'm using is this aerospace grade defence cable which um, is from Gore, WL Gore, and can go up to a frequency range of 18 gigahertz. So the losses that we're dealing with up to 1 gigahertz are minimal. So what we're hoping to achieve there is, is near um, parity between what the instrument's producing and what we're measuring on the spectrum analyzer. Um, now, as you can see there, we're measuring uh, minus uh, 14 point something dBm, which is fine with me. That's levels, no, nothing wrong with that. And uh, then what I'm going to do there, I'm going to start to reduce the RF level. Now, what we're looking for here, you'll also hear the relays in the Marconi test set click. Uh, there are some shallow sounding clicks, but then there's some major clicks you'll hear. And each time you hear those clicks, the step attenuator switching in um, physical RF pads, attenuation pads, pi attenuators, which then reduce the signal in either 10, 20, 30 dB, 40 dB steps. And, um, and then there's some fine adjustments as well, which is done by the ALC. So when we adjust the variable control in the front of the test set, the levels between those physical um, attenuation steps so here with the big clicks uh, we need to check that those levels are varying properly as well between the physical switch steps so that's what we're going to do now so if I begin to reduce the RF level down to uh, neg 120 dBm so again we're receiving that level here and as we can see there's I'm reducing the level it's declining smoothly as it should be so that's neg 30 dBm now we're approaching and uh, again we're receiving neg 30 dBm there now if I continue to adjust the, the level on the front of the test set down to uh, minus 40 dBm so that's, that's a click there so as I move the RF level up and down to get that relay to switch in what I'm looking for there is whether the RF signal vanishes altogether and then either doesn't come back or it, it comes back within a few seconds because often that's a sign of dirty contacts on the um, step attenuators solenoids that actuate the, uh, the pi attenuators so we're getting down to minus 40 dBm now and that's minus 40 dBm level as, as can be seen there on the, on the Marconi 
minus 40 dBm and obviously I'm looking as I'm adjusting this control as I'm adjusting the fine attenuation there uh, on this control I'm looking to see that level as well as appearing here on the spectrum analyzer and that's really important is that so uh, we've obviously confirmed neg 40 dBm is where we're at and then we can get down to neg 50 dBm now and uh, not be long before we'll be hitting the noise flying about another 50 dB so that's obviously okay that level again and uh, we're doing we're doing okay and then if we carry on going down to neg 60 dBm again we've got that you can hear that relay clicking it's nice and smooth there's nothing wrong with that attenuator so minus 60 dBm again recording minus 60 and then as we're getting down here look to minus 70 dBm now again we were looking for the smoothness and decline in the signal without any jitter or erratic movements and we're uh, receiving minus 70 dBm and then we're going down to minus 80 dBm now so that's minus 80 dBm and again we're capturing that uh, 7980 minus 79 flashing 80 dBm and then we're getting down to minus 90 dBm and now this is when the measurement starts to get tricky because obviously we're getting towards the noise floor and uh, again we're still getting that minus 90 dBm there and then minus 95 dBm there look and that's before then we, we get beyond the point of measure because as I reduce the RF level now into the sub minus 100 dBm range we're not able to really resolve that signal very well until I start to increase it again so what I'm going to do now uh, we're going to adjust the frequency of the um, radio test set now to um, 300 megahertz so we're going to go um, um, RF gen frequency 3 uh, zero, zero megahertz we've left it at minus uh, 15 dBm there there we are back to the spectrum analyzer uh, frequency 300 megahertz and then again back with the marker normal and then with the the marker onto there now you can do zero span obviously um, for more accurate measurements so you can do span zero and then you'd now be measuring that absolute level uh, which gives you more stability and as we can see there we're getting that uh, that level minus 15 so if I adjust it in 1 dB steps at 300 megahertz that's minus 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 5 6 and each time I'm pressing that increment key now and decrement key uh, in 1 dB steps at 300 megahertz you can see that we're getting that smooth transition of a dB steps so that's uh, neg 56 dBm and as you can see we're still receiving neg 56 so this is a more accurate way if you like of seeing the level and you can carry on doing that until you get right down into the noise floor so if I just increase it again back to there that's neg, neg 50 dBm neg 60 dBm there um, that's neg 65 uh, that's neg 70 dBm uh, neg 75 neg 80 and then obviously neg 85 dBm now coming up and then that'll be neg 90 dBm and again the signal's there and then neg 95 dBm and this is then where we start beyond that to get into the noise floor so as you can see there we're in the noise floor so technically I can measure that's neg 100 dBm here and we're sort of still being able to resolve a signal at zero span down to neg 100 uh, whereas we couldn't really do that at uh, 100 kilohertz bandwidth so that's the importance of using zero span um, or 10 hertz as it is in this case 
But um, that gives us a level of neg 100 dBm there, and obviously if I if I go further than that, it, it starts getting in the noise floor. We can see there's a measurement difference, but that's neg 102 dBm, neg 101, neg 100, neg 99. Uh, neg 98 dBm so around about the neg 100 it becomes um, illegible does the measurement so we need to check beyond that which we're going to be doing with another instrument pretty soon um, so that's that's just a demonstration of that now obviously if I now change the frequency to uh, 600 megahertz uh, RF gen frequency 600 megahertz Again, RF gen level, we'll set it to uh, minus 15 dBm. And, uh, okay, so we'll go to frequency, 600 megahertz. And then, of course, marker, normal, and then you can do peak find and stuff like that as well with this, but I always like to uh, twiddle with things. And if you wanted to, you could set the span again to 100 kilohertz. So again, minus 15 dBs. Now if I go down now in, uh, again, that's minus 20 dBm, minus 25 dBm. I'll set the increment up here to uh, 5 dB steps and then I'm having to press the bloody thing all the time. RF gen, increment. 5 dBs right so that's minus 30 dBm minus 35 40 dBm 45 50 55 60 65 70 75 80 85 90 and then obviously 95 dBm minus 95 minus 100 so we can see the levels there now if I do increment for 1 dB steps we can see that if I we've got that nice smooth change of a dB before we hit the noise floor then come back up again just check the relay contacts are all okay there we are so that will be minus 16 dB 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, again, um, minus 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, down to neg 90 dBm, and then one, two, three, four, five, down to neg ninety-five dBm. So you can see there that the the one dB steps incrementals are working without a problem. And as a, again, when I adjust the RF level variable control down, nice smooth action, no problem there. Right, we'll zoom on to one gigahertz now. Uh, RF gen frequency one thousand megahertz, and then we'll do frequency here. 1 gigahertz again uh, we'll put the marker on normal and then zoom it to the the center of the waveform and uh, and then basically um, you've got to breathe on this thing obviously right so we're again minus 15 dBm and again if I adjust the levels and start to uh, I'll put that increment in RF gen level increment 5 dB steps minus 15 dBm messed it up minus 15 dBm and then RF gen level increment 5 dB steps and now so that's minus 20 dBm at 1 gigahertz as you can see the level is accurate there we've got the minus 20 there minus 25 minus 30 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, and then that's when we hit the noise floor then at neg 100 dBm. Um, so if I increase that back up, 
and then we set the RF10 level increment now to um, 1 dB steps and so that's uh, minus 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 and then it's like again 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and then back to minus 30 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 minus 40 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 uh, which is minus 50 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and again we're listening for the relay contacts and we're making sure that the signal is decreasing in 1 dB step increments uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 is minus 70 dBs and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 minus 80 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 minus 90 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 minus 100 dBs so that's we've got that nice and again if we just check incrementing as well as decrementing and again go down just smooth operation and there's nothing wrong with that no that attenuator is working absolutely wonderful the 1 dB steps throughout its dynamic range on 10 megahertz 300 megahertz 600 megahertz and now 1 gigahertz are bang on so there's nothing wrong with that We've done all those tests now to neg 100 dBm, but what we need to do is check beyond neg 100 dBm down to around about neg 120, neg 130, which is our limits of the signal generator to make sure that the um, the remaining pads in the RF attenuator are working below neg 100 dBm. So we're going to have a look at another instrument uh, with that. So from here now we'll move on to this other instrument that can measure beyond this instrument and uh, then from there we'll do the audio measurements with the RF signal generators mod for AM and FM measurements and audio frequency measurements for the modulation and uh, then we can move on to transmitter measurements but at least that gives you a little inkling of uh, how we measure that signal okay for the next measurement now we're going to be using the uh, Aeroflex spectrum analyzer and this has a unique feature on it which we're going we're gonna to show you so where we were before we managed to get to roughly about neg 95 dBm and then we couldn't measure it anymore on the other spectrum analyzer however this spectrum analyzer has a trick up its sleeve which we're going to see now um, so we need to carry on beyond neg 95 dBm as low as the test set can generate to check the, the actual usable levels and um, what we're doing at the moment, we're just generating a, a signal at um, minus 80 uh, dBm, uh, 300 megahertz. And obviously, as we can see here, uh, we are actually now getting that level on the, on the spectrum analyzer, which is minus 80 dBm. So, the dynamic range on this spectrum analyzer is a little better than the uh, Agilent one. Uh, because if I reduce the RF level now to neg 90 dBm which is coming up very shortly that's neg 90 dBm and obviously we've got the accuracy and then that's neg 95 dBm which is where, roughly where the Agilent couldn't monitor beyond that and we're receiving that signal there quite well on the um, level and then we get down to neg 100 dBm. We've just gone through another step range there, so that's minus 100 dBm. And as you can see, the signal's still there, even though it's just above a noise floor. Because if I switch the signal off, you can see the signal vanishes altogether. Bring the signal back, you can see it's just there in the noise floor, just above the noise floor. It's barely readable, however, the um, instrument's resolving it still. Now, if I get it to minus 105 dBm now, so approximately 10 dBs beyond the range of the Agilent one, uh, we can still see that it's trying to resolve something, but because it's in the noise now, we, we've lost the measurement. We can still see something's there, uh, but unfortunately it's, uh, it's not measurable. Because if I switch the signal off, you can see it vanishes where the marker, little uh, green circle is and then the bouncy ball and when I put it back you can see the signal comes back so that's neg 105 
five dBm roughly is that signal there. Uh, so you can definitely see something's there. That's off. That's on. And it's just it's just barely visible. Now the trick this particular spectrum analyzer has up its sleeve, if I reintroduce the signal back again at neg 105 dBm, is we've got an internal amplifier uh, which is on this particular instrument. And if I select that 20 dB internal amplifier on, now we can go beyond the level that we previously could get to on other instruments. Now we're resolving the signal again and we're able to measure that and we're getting neg 105 dBm as per what's on the on the on the Marconi there. So what I'm gonna do now, we're gonna carry on and we're gonna see what we can what we can get to. So, if we carry on down to neg 110, now we've just gone through another switch range there, a smaller switch range. So that's neg 110 dBm. And again, we're still getting that level of accuracy there. And then we get right down now to neg 115 dBm. And it's struggling now because it's, it's near the noise and that will be the neg 120 dbm just there so we've sort of got to the end of the dynamic range of the instrument now if i switch the signal off now the that the noise floor on the spectrum analyzer is now roughly about neg 130 dbm um so obviously it's got 30 dbs more dynamic range than the Agilent uh, has and then switch the signal back on and you can see the signals there now we can do a zero span on it you know that's definitely something we can do like we did on the Agilent one to get a more accurate measurement but as you can see there that we can get down to roughly neg 115 dbm I'd say where we can definitely resolve the signal uh, I think beyond that neg 115 it gets more difficult obviously uh, and that's when we can't measure so we've only got really this test set goes down to about neg 131 dbm so we're not that far off now and we can start to look at now introducing external amplifiers uh, which are calibrated external ones by um, by Marconi that I have to then amplify that signal further so we can check down to those ranges at uh, neg 131 dbm so you can see where we're going with this we're, we're going right down to the extremes of a dynamic range of the marconi radio test set um so you know it proves that we've not got that far to go because neg 115 dbm if we go beyond that we get down to about neg 120 so we've got about another 15 dBs to go and it gets down to about neg 135 dBm thereabouts. So we've not got that far to go really. Another 20 dB amplifier added to that will certainly uh, enable us to resolve that down. Now obviously uh, when we're looking at another amplifier to introduce into here then we need to do some checks, probably a sweep check um, between the 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 parts the track gem on the spectrum analyzer so that we can sweep the amplifier at say 300 megahertz give it a zero dbm input for example or uh, whatever level we choose and check the absolute db gain at that frequency of the amplifier we can write that down so we know what that level is going to be at uh, our given room temperature of stability when it's been on for say half an hour or an hour uh, then we can connect that to the Marconi uh, in series with the spectrum analyzer knowing that figure we can set up the external um, attenuation on the um, Marconi then to um, to measure the amplifier in series with the the spectrum analyzer so or we can just take the measurement as is and add 20 dBs or whatever the figure that the amplifier produces as gain. 
we can also look at the noise figure the amplifier and take that into consideration but for the purpose of this video we'll just keep it simple and we'll we'll just use the amplifier in series with the test set and the and the spectrum analyzer and then we can get that that extra 20 something db gain um which we can introduce to check the rf gen level down to you know neg one three something dbm um again we'll be going beyond most usable ranges of radio receivers even the best uhf or vhf radio receivers can tend to get down to about neg 123 neg possibly neg 125 at the very best but beyond that um, most receivers are incapable of receiving a signal at uh, a level below that anyway so we only need to check as far as we can into the neg 130 dbm range uh, really to get a, a clear indication that there's nothing wrong with the instrument right so uh, onwards and upwards okay so the next very important measurement we need to do concerns the fm and am modulation that the um, rf sig gen on the marconi outputs it needs to be accurate in level and frequency and without distortion or phase error uh, because that's highly critical measurement that we do with the marconi when we're aligning radio receivers etc so we need to make sure the level's accurate now what we're going to be doing now is testing the signaling standards like DTMF, cell call, CTCSS, etc. We're going to be looking at the modulation uh, analyzer on the test at the mod gen. So we're going to be sending a signal out, a modulated FM and AM carrier on the RF to the uh, HP8920 Agilent radio test set there. And we're going to be checking the levels on there and making sure that they're accurate. So first of all, I'm just going to go into signaling standards first of all, um, so we can check that, tones, and then we'll just go to sequential first. I'll select, uh, as you can see there, there's a lot of different cell call standards. I'll select EEA. Uh, I've already inputted uh, test tones in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and uh, now we can hop over to this. So when I'm, go I've, I've, I'm injecting a signal already, just to save time here on this RF port here we've got the RF analyzing TX mode and now we can go into uh, analyzing the carrier more so here we have the uh, facility to be able to select different uh, encoders decoders etc so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, just set this camera up a bit better Okay, so I'm going to go to uh, the filters, just to make sure they're set properly because the cell call tones are actually higher in frequency than the speech audio. So I've got 15 kHz low pass filter and a 50 kHz high pass filter, so that's okay. Go to a decoder, uh, then we've got the, you can select the different things there, a bit DTMF etc, which we'll be going through in a moment. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to have it on uh, tone sequence and then you've got the different standards like we saw on the Marconi you've got all these different standards so we'll select EEA uh, we'll put a continuous measurement on and now I'm going to send a tone burst which you'll hear what that tone sounds like so we'll send that and there we are so we're sending one two three four five the last tone's repeated so we've got that there so that's working correctly um, so there's nothing wrong with that there are other tone standards as well depending on which one you're going for um, the ZVEI 1 and 2 there's EIA as well um, we can try that see where that works tone burst return tones sequential and then uh, I've only got on here CCIR, ZVEI, DZVEI, EEA or user defined so let's have a look here ZVEI1, let's try that one then ZVEI and then tone burst there we are, so I'm just sending one, two, three, four, tone burst on uh, on that tone standard. 
so that's working okay so the next one we'll check now is DTMF uh, again uh, to standard and then select DTMF actually I've messed up there it's that one DTMF and we'll set that there right let's go to return tones DTMF and then I'll just send a sequence out to it see if it picks this up I might need to set my filters oh no it's worked so I've sent basically uh, 1 to 9 0 and then um, star hash A B C D so it's decoded all that correctly as it should do so that's correct right I'll just return tones so I'll now go to um, the cut the thing again uh, I'll go to let's have a look here if I go to TX We'll set a 300 hertz low pass filter or high pass filter and I want to now put a sub audio tone on there mod setup um, set mod frequency I want to put a 67 hertz tone on and I want the level, set model level um, I'm going to put in 500 hertz and then we're going to turn that on and we've got a sine wave, 67 hertz right, so 300 hertz uh, locus filter and we are getting a 67 hertz signal there let's have a look put that down to 15 kilohertz which it is and then vertical division change that down to and there we are, we can see the sub audio tone now in a second so that's the sub audible tone now if I up that to uh, in level and then we go back to TX and then we're getting if I just change that to uh, Hertz Hertz there we are we're getting the 67 Hertz and if I do um, frequency uh, 250.3 hertz, I can type it in properly. There we are. So we've got the 250.3 hertz CTCSS tone as well. And uh, so that's all there. Obviously, if I go to the scope, I'll go back to the scope, and then we go. Just get the level down a bit. Right. If I change the shape, it's more like square, and then triangle, sawtooth. And then obviously sign. So depending on what filters we've got, obviously on the uh, test set, I'll denote what it'll let through and what it won't let through. But I just want to see if a CTCSS was definitely there. And uh, we'll just turn that off. Right. Okay. The next one I wanted to have a look at. Uh, I'll just put these filters back to. kilohertz low pass filter decoder and then I think there was I think CD DCS I think that was it just 
standard. Let's see whether we can get the DCS tone out of it and uh, we'll send that. Right. So I'm currently sending um, a data rate for a DCS tone of 134.4 Hz, uh, bit rate at 250 Hz level, parity normal, and uh, basically I'm getting that data rate in the top there, top left hand corner for that particular uh, code. So that's working. So I can't grumble at that. And I don't think there's much else really that this Marconi does that the uh, thing there's digital page as well. We might have a look at Poxag if we can get to that. But uh, I'll just stop that code from being sent. So that's digital coded squelch. Um, if I then go to return tones poxag now when I send a poxag tone this is what it sounds like um, if they'll do it RF gen frequency 300 megahertz So that's what the Poxag tone sounds like. So it could be accessible under DigiPage, I'm not sure. Uh, standard Poxag. And um, so I'm doing, I've got a certain message I'm going to put in here. And let's just see what works. See whether we can. There you are. Look. Number of pages. Function eleven. Blah blah blah. So that seems to work. I'm obviously getting uh, message one, which on what I'm sending there. Uh, address message. And then we'll send that as well. that's appearing as well, page of data, option 11, number of pages 1, so everything seems to be working as it should be, just try different messages, and see if I can get a text message to go as well, um, so let's have a look, tone only, well change the tone only mode there where it says data type to uh, alphanumeric, and there we are, we've got the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And then I'll just send this message. There we go. Incorrect parity received. It's probably down to the fact that it's uh, message type. Message, another message. Now the parity I'm sending is do, 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 do. Let's have a look here. Five hundred and twelve hertz bit rate. Parity invert. Try a different address. There you go. So that's like an alert um, message just for a beeper type thing going off there. 
so I'm very happy with that indeed uh, nothing wrong with that at all it, uh, it seems to you know nothing wrong with that at all looks fine contact Marconi that was the other one in the message so it all works nothing to worry about there right the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check the modulation the uh, one kilohertz test tone that comes out the 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 test set so we'll just uh, turn the volume down a bit so we don't get annoyed by it um, so we'll take the mod gen level and then we'll set that to on and then we should be getting one kilohertz tone FM at one kilohertz modulation so what I'll need to do is set up the speech band on the filter to 303 kilohertz and then obviously um, the IF filter we're gonna have to keep an eye on that because I'm gonna go up now in level so we're modulating the FM carrier with one kilohertz tone at one kilohertz deviation and you can see there the FM deviation is more or less spot on and then if I do set mod uh, level increment and then put one kilohertz increment in so if I increment that that's two kilohertz three obviously four five six seven eight and then obviously if we just go on to the 230 kilohertz I have filter once you get above 5 kilohertz, you need to switch to that. So it's 8 kilohertz, uh, FM deviation, 9, 10. I think it goes up to 25 kilohertz, does this uh, Marco. And this, that's 15 kilohertz, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 3, 4, 5. So as you can see there, you know, 25 kilohertz deviation right the next test we're going to do um we're just going to have a look at that on the scope as well just to make sure that that looks okay uh, vertical division we'll display it in 25 kilohertz 10 kilohertz per division and then obviously change the time base so we can see a nice sinusoidal waveform there nothing wrong with that perfectly good and uh, the F analyzer frequencies there as well so if I now go to uh, set mod frequency increment um, say one kilohertz then I should be able to that's two kilohertz three four five six seven eight well it got to about eight kilohertz there unless we uh, change the filter there to 99 kilohertz and then it'll keep going so that's eight kilohertz nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen about sixteen k's there So it's picking it up and uh, I'll just do set mod level back down to uh, uh, 2 kilohertz level and then the frequency right so that's 15 kilohertz 16 kilohertz 17 kilohertz 18 19 20 and that's the highest limit is 20 kilohertz on the audio frequency of the uh, of the Marconi which is 20 kilohertz there so the next most important measurement is doing the AM depth so what we're going to do now we're going to return the test measurement back to 1 kilohertz mod 
um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce AM modulation um, so I'm going to set this now to um, um, set mod level 60% AM so now we're on AM at 60% mod so now we need to change the uh, analyzer now to read that so we'll go down to uh, the decoder is it or oh, is it decoder is it there can't remember where it is now mode no I don't think it's there can't remember where, where it is now where is it oh it's there look AF analyzer in instead of FMD mod we'll select AMD mod and now we're getting the 60%. So I'm just going to introduce the speech band filter and uh, the AF filter at 15 kilohertz. So again, we've got the one killer mod tone and we're at 60% mod, give or take 0.2 of a percent thereabouts. So if I do increment on that, and uh, I put in 10% increment so now that's 70% 80% 90 and then 100% will probably lose a carrier which we do so that's 90% 80 70 60 50% 40% 30% 20 10% and no mod on well, 0% that works okay there's nothing wrong there so yeah pretty good um, I think now what we need to do is the uh, AF output um, the AF gen output there couple that now to the radio the Agilent test set and check the AF output levels now on the on the Marconi make sure it's outputting the correct AF level back soon Okay, so the next test we're going to do now is the F uh, output tests and input. So basically, uh, these ports here on the front, the F gen out and F in. We're going to do those tests now for frequency and level accuracy. So uh, what we do in order to get to that is really need to be in the RX screen like we are now, not the TX screen, the RX screen. Then within there, we press the green button at the top, the F test button and then we get an audio test screen. Now what there is uh, on this particular um, device is that you've got two AF gens, Gen 1 and Gen 2. So in order to select Gen 1 you press set mod and then number 2 and it flicks down to number 2 then and you can set up the gen for that. And then set mod uh, 1 and then it goes back to there. Now note what happens if you select frequency for example and then you set something up and then level for example and you've dealt with AF Gen 1 for example if you then want to go to AF Gen 2 this is where a lot of people make the mistake because what they do they press set mod then 2 and of course as soon as you press a numerical digit it thinks you're either changing the level or the frequency so if you press set mod again and then set 2 it then changes that back to 2 as if you're inputting a frequency of two something or other and then people get think well how, how can I get to AF Gen 2 well that's quite simple uh, what you do if you just press the AF Gen button again this AF test button here it clears the frequency and level so when you then go set mod again and press number two it flicks to number two likewise if I say set a frequency of three kilohertz and um, and if I wanted to get back to set mod gen 1 again if I press set mod gen 1 okay mod which is this set mod and number 1 he thinks I'm inputting a frequency and that's often a question I get asked about Marconi 2955 is how the hell do you switch between the two signal generators so that's how you do it you just literally um, you put in a level or whatever but just press the green button again and watch then it goes back and then if you do set mod 2, set mod 1, flicks between them. So that's just a, a quick info is that one. It can be a pain in the backside and you can spend many hours reading the manual before you pick that up. 
Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to emulate this signal coming out the AFGen output port and we're going to analyse that on the Agilent test set. So what we're going to do, we're going to connect a BNC to the AFGen output port of the um, Marconi 2955. We set a frequency of 1 kilohertz uh, frequency and I want to set a level of 1 volt for reference. Now we're going to then connect that then to what is the AF input on the Mark on the Agilent radio test set and already just preset the instrument okay so I'll turn that down so we're already receiving some form of audio signal there so what I want to do now I just want to see how far how close that is uh, and already I can see it's nearly at one volt it's just literally um, very very fractionally off not worthy of adjustment simply because the fact that it's well within its error limits in the specification and laid down in the service manual but what I would like to do is just verify um, that it's um, its distortion is in good in good stead but first of all um, I want to go to AF analyzer on here and I want to select particular filters which we'll look at now okay so what I'd like to do is I'd like to set up um, F filter number two and I want to put that at uh, uh, three kilohertz top end filter basically low pass filter so anything above three kilohertz any noise is filtered off then I want to go to where it says sign out here and I want to select distortion okay so we're reading the level correctly at one volt as and that's, and that's off it and then we're reading distortion at 0.1% that tells me that the AF output amplifiers in the Marconi 2955 are working fine then we can go to the oscilloscope just to verify the waveform shape and we can do that by reducing this and then obviously going then to the period and we can see there nice sinusoidal waveform without distortion everything's lovely that's how it should be now, if we go back to where we were before, and then to the AF analyzer again, and then in here, I just want to take that filter off because we're gonna now advance in frequency. So I'm gonna put the 99 kilohertz filter in. I want to go to back to here again, where it said sign add, and if you remember, I want the AF frequency. So that's now the frequency at one kilohertz. If we want to, we can actually set up a reference level by highlighting the kilohertz field doing shift and then reference on the uh, Agilent test set which is uh, shift and then reference set and then you can put in one kilohertz and it'll tell you how far off you are and that's good in in a measurement because obviously you can read the frequency if you want but you can also read the errors up or lower frequency error limits and it'll display that measurement so if you bring in something in like with a potentiometer then obviously you can adjust it better it'll tell you how far you are away from where you need to be but for this test there's no need to do that because we're not doing any measurements so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to set the uh, increment now on the marconi um, so we're now going to go to frequency i want to set up an increment of 100 hertz in frequency and then we're going to go back to the agilent and we're just going to turn the volume up now so we can hear it okay and obviously I'm going to up that now in 100 hertz steps so 1.1 kilohertz to so we're right the way up and uh, we should be able to read right, that's 8.4 kilohertz let's get right up to 10 kilohertz 10 kilohertz there look and then just keep going and going and going I think this goes up to about 20 or kilohertz something like that let's just keep going see how far we get um, 17 18 19 20 20 kilohertz so we're now at 20 kilohertz on the Marconi as well look 20 kilohertz and of course the voltage has remained the same uh, 1 volt so we're, uh, we're, we're good to go there and if we go to the oscilloscope and we look at that waveform there we can see it nice and clearly 
even at 20 kilohertz the audio waveform is uh, is in good condition as it should be sinusoidal without distortion so that's good it's worthy to note as well on a lot of test instruments if you're trying to measure distortion at um, frequencies other than one kilohertz it may not read that like cyanide and distortion some instruments can some instruments can't it all depends on uh, how good they are uh, Rod and Swartz test gear I think might be able to I think Agilent can I'm not sure about other test gear but some some of them are quite specific about measuring distortion sign out at one kilohertz specifically and no other frequency so I'm going to now reduce the um, the frequency back to where it was and here we go we're coming down in frequency and uh, obviously look if any distortions I'm just going to get to the audio range of the mic that we're recording on there we are back to one kilohertz so that proves that so there's nothing wrong there with the AF output uh, on the 2955 that's all in calibration um, so now we can advance on to the next test which is to check the F input on the 2955 okay so the next test now that we've known the the frequency at one volt uh, changed is what we can do now is we can check the level itself um, so if I go on to uh, F set mod gen level and then we put that back on again sorry and then I've set up an increment um, set mod level increment and then I set it to 100 millivolts and uh, once we've done that then I can obviously increase or decrease the voltage appropriately that's coming out so again if I can adjust the level again each time it's, it's going to reduce now for an accurate result we will go back to the F analyzer obviously um, we are at uh, one volt there as we can see here in this field and then this would be 800 millivolt um, that would be 800 millivolt rather that would be 700 600 500 400 300 200 100 now there okay and then obviously nothing so that's 100 millivolt now obviously we're about to hear that as well step up and likewise above a volt just keep going until we get to its maximum output which is 4 volts and we're getting that so we're seeing that varying we shouldn't see at all any of that change distort on the oscilloscope um, so if I can set the amplitude so we can get that within the top limits and then as I reduce the level we can see that nicely adjusting and then obviously increasing as well so that defines the full tests full range of tests for the AF out uh, is we've looked at frequency accuracy level accuracy distortion accuracy right the next test then obviously is to check the AF input now by Marconi so we move a port over to this uh, audio output jack uh, which is obviously connected then to the uh, AF input jack on the Marconi what we need to do now we just need to set this uh, this test up under TX test and then we go straight into the what is the AF analyzer um, so if we just bring that over you can see the screen a bit better okay then so we've got the frequency at uh, one kilohertz which i'm happy with i just want to set that to one volt and then we've got that now set to one volt so now we can flip over to the marconi and have a look at the measurement there and so naturally um as we can see there we've got uh, a reading a frequency already of 999.9 hertz frequency uh, we can select different filters 50 kilohertz low pass filter and obviously if i put on the 300 hertz filter it'll cut the measurement off which it should do because the frequency is higher than 300 hertz and then i can put the speech band filter on 300 hertz to 3.4 kilohertz 
and um, we can see that the bar charts reading correctly as well as one two and three volts so each increment represents a volt uh, if we go to the oscilloscope 10 volts per division let's just adjust this gives us a good opportunity as well to switch and and check the oscilloscope buttons are working uh, and then obviously we can we can look at that it's really good scope on the marconi 2955 um so again we're getting the af volts 0.9999 volts uh, which is one volt obviously as as the crow flies um and the frequency 999 kilohertz at uh, 199.9 hertz rather so obviously uh, i can alter the frequency as well on the we can hear the volume and then obviously if we were to get it below 300 hertz and then select the low pass filter um, so we are on 300 hertz now we should still be able to measure the voltage so we're at, currently at 100 hertz in frequency and we're still getting one volt af so that's what we're looking for to test the low pass and the high pass filters which are just here these so obviously if we select then the um, 50 kilohertz low pass filter it means once we get above 3.4 kilohertz in frequency we should also be able to see that measurement as well so remain at one volt so there we're at five kilohertz and we're still receiving one volt and obviously i can uh, see that waveform still nice and sinusoidally clean and then obviously as part of that i'm sorry if the sounds quite high pitched is i can check the 50 kilohertz low pass filter obviously works but then i can also equally check the speech band filter works where we can still see the waveform but we're not measuring anything uh, at that frequency and obviously the higher we go you know going right up now to sort of um, 16 17 kilohertz we can't hear it obviously it's above the frequency range of human hearing and uh, of course we can still see the oscilloscope measure that but the actual af volts uh, will not be measuring until we select obviously the 50 kilohertz low pass filter and therefore we can uh, we can see that uh, likewise the af gen level i can decrease that in line with the uh, measurement and then increase it proportionally as well to the maximum of the hp agilent test set uh, which i'm not sure if, he, if the agilent can go a bit further than the marco on in voltage uh, it's getting right up look to sort of about Maybe, maybe it goes up to 4 volts, just like the Marconi did. So, oh no, it's going beyond that. It's going even higher. So I can certainly see a good 5, 6 volts there of... Uh, Peter it out at 6. At that frequency, so that's good. At um, 16 kilohertz. So we've checked the AF input... Um, obviously on the Marconi there we go so there's nothing wrong with that so that's the complete test of those two AF and now we'll look at the external mod input don't forget the single and repetitive test, so if we single sweep and then remove the F input um, it should remain and obviously then if we go back to the repetitive then the signal will be there wherever we've got the audio connected or not. So that's important as well. Now to the DC voltage check when we select this to DC volts now and um, let's check that with the power supply. One of the other little refinements as well, which you can go into under the TX Audio setup again using the F Gen output, is you can change the shape of the sine wave. Whereas before, under receiver test, uh, if you went back to what would be uh, receiver test AF, you can't actually select the shape in this screen. Um, you can only select the frequency and level. 
whereas if you go to um, transmitter test and then tones and then go to mod setup which is a top selection then you can change the shape so we can have it sine square triangle and then saw to back to sign again so you can look at that again on the oscilloscope so again to repeat on the audio output the fgen output of the instrument you can then couple that into the f input and then you can see there the waveform so if i change the shape to square wave so we can obviously hear that as well triangular wave and then sawtooth wave and then back to sign important to check that right so the next measurement now is to check the external mod input so the idea here is we inject an air signal in there at particular frequency say one kilohertz and that in turn has a direct effect then on the receiver signal generators modulation um, and so instead of it being internally modulated by the, its own internal AF gens, it's actually externally modulated. So what we're going to do, first of all, we're just going to set up the uh, Agilent test set so that it has the uh, necessary AF output. So we're going to go to a TX test on, the, on there, and then we've got one kilohertz tone, which I'm happy with. I'm going to set that to 100 millivolts, which we're done. So now on the output connector, um, on the Agilent test set, which is this one, AF out, we're going to connect our audio lead in there. And then all onto the Marconi, what we're going to do is we're going to connect the other end of the audio lead into the external mod input connector. Now what we're going to do, uh, we've got the RF output here. Uh, we now need to set that instrument, the, Marco, the Agilent test set, so that it picks that up. Um, so we can go to spectrum analyzer for example and I can select this antenna port which is a sensitive RF port uh, for low level RF signals which is what the RF gen puts out I can select antenna instead of RF main so we're switching from there to there and then I can go to the center frequency type in 300 megahertz which is what uh, what we were uh, looking at on the uh, Marconi as its frequency there 300 megahertz and so what I'm looking for now is to try and pull out the amplitude so there's a couple of things that we do here I can alter the reference level there we are I'm pulling a signal out already now I can confirm that that's the case because obviously if I remove the that part there we obviously no modulation on the RF signal plug the AF back on so that's confirming that, uh, you know, as, as is here, if you turn the mod gens off, which this is here, that's turned to off, uh, then obviously you're only able to externally modulate. If that's switched on, then even when you unplug that, it will still continue to modulate the carrier. So that, that proves that. Now, in synergy with that, obviously the higher the AF level coming out of the uh, AF gem port the more modulation that's going to, going to give so obviously as a direct effect on the on the modulation um, so as you can see here we can pull it right out and we can see the frequency modulation content shortly on the actual uh, carrier itself so there we are we're getting that nicely so it's uh, it's there now obviously if I go back to uh, TX test we're obviously getting a, a deviation as well of 1.4 kilohertz which is represented in the top right so if I go to um, the AF gen level there um, so if I increase the audio level coming out to the Marconi's external modulation you can see it's having a direct effect on the FM modulation and likewise when I decrease the level the FM modulation is going down so that's how you can externally modulate the um, the test set so that proves that's working absolutely superbly nothing wrong there okay so the final of all the tests now for the audio side is the AC DC volt so we've got connected here 
a BNC uh, adapter to banana and we've got our um, Rigol power supply supplying uh, or our Siglent power supply rather supplying 10 volts DC to this port so we'll flip that now to DC and we should be measuring 10 volts DC which we are just there well within specification and likewise when we go to the oscilloscope as well we should be able to see the uh, the the graticule correct at 5 volts per division from center line which is obviously 0 volts we've got two graticules and then the line there in synergy with the voltage which is coming in DC wise so that proves the uh, DC side is working without a problem as well obviously when we flip back to AC then the voltage will disappear so it's able to switch between AC and DC voltage measurements that's typically used with a scope probe for doing DC checks on circuits power supplies things like that and again it has a reasonable measurement range on the input but it's not a particularly high voltage input that's allowed on it I think it's about 30 40 volts which is adequate for doing radio repairs and things like that and general repair servicing work so that's that okay now to the transmitter tests so in this test we're going to measure two things transmit RF power and modulation frequency and modulation deviation all in the same test so in order to do that what we've got we've got the RF input port on the end type here connected to the uh, the Calmus wideband amplifier uh, which is this unit here and uh, this unit has a frequency range of 500 kilohertz to 1 gigahertz and it outputs a power up to about uh, 15 watts and we can use this as a basically it's a, a linear amplifier that's wide banded so it has more or less the same gain across its entire frequency range so how we use this is we drive it using the Agilent and so we set up a duplex test now so that basically what we've got uh, we've got the duplex output port at the front here uh, the duplex output port drives the Calmus amplifier then the output of the Calmus amplifier then connects to the Marconi so as a reference what we're going to do is we've set up already um, just the finer detail which I can show you here and uh, we can go right in and, and adjust that so what we've got uh, we've set up the um, this that you've got if you like both halves of the screen are broken into two halves so we've got um, the we're going to have a manual or uh, tune there frequency 300 megahertz I've decided to use the input port is going to be on the end type which is the RF in uh, the 15 kilo IF filters there the RF gen frequency coming out of the Agilent is again 300 megahertz in order to drive the amplifier so it gives 10 watts output approximately we need 8 dBm plus 8 dBm drive um, then okay we've got um, the duplex port selected on the input um, sorry on the RFG output and so that then it goes off to the Calmus amplifier to drive it but also we're modulating that 300 megahertz at plus 8 dBm carrier with a 1 kilohertz tone at 3, 3 kilohertz FM deviation so what I'm going to do uh, just to demonstrate this is now I'm going to connect the as a reference first we need to take a reference measurement from the Agilent radio test set so we're going to connect the output of a Calmus amplifier to the Agilent radio test set and then we're going to introduce 28 volts to the Calmus power amplifier and it should give us a reading um, and there we are so we're looking at about 10.4 and it's diminishing all the time um, about 10 watts roughly there and that's what we're looking looking to achieve so we're just waiting for that to sell to settle about 10 watts okay right so what we need to do now is obviously change the RF output over to the Marconi and make a, then a comparison measurement against the Agilent test set so we've connected that up 
and now we're ready to do that now so connect that there and then connect the 28 volts to the power amplifier and there we are we're getting the power that we should be so I'll just zoom in on that so that's spot on there's nothing wrong with that at all can't complain so there's plenty of power there on that so there's nothing wrong with the power measurement now what I'm going to do I'm going to reintroduce it again and this time we're going to check for modulation so just introduce it again and we've obviously got 3 kilohertz mod as well turn on the scope now this time on the scope we're, we're, we're looking at modulation content and we can hear the modulation as well and I'm going to start to vary the RF power now uh, down and as we can see the RF power I need to just test as we go through all the different ranges in the um, attenuator as it you'll hear a little click as it switches in a different attenuator pad so that's one there I'm just going up and down hear it so I'm just testing that and then we're going to get right down into the noise into the milliwatt ranges and uh, we're down to 20 odd milliwatts now on the end type port and then we're getting really low now and that's when it it's shuts off so starts to come in at round about 1 milliwatt or 0 dBm and then we'll just adjust back up as you can hear those clicks of the RF attenuate auto adjusting on the on the TX board so that's good right um, so that proves the modulations working um, that the TX frequency the mod frequency is 1 kilohertz the level 3 kilohertz if I adjust the mod level now down to 1 kilohertz obviously that's 1 kilohertz modulation and it's following suit and again we can increase that and see that nicely on the thing and likewise if I put in 10 kilohertz modulation again getting sort of 9.979899 ish and if I introduce the 300 to 3.4 kilohertz filter so that's all there as well so that's fine absolutely fine nothing wrong with that at all okay on to the next measurement okay next test down the low power port for the Marconi we're getting 300 milliwatts just uh, roughly a bit above it uh, we'll take this now and switch this over to the uh, low power BNC port here uh, which is on the on the front there so we've switched between the ports and then obviously we're getting you know 350 milliwatts roughly there on that particular measurement so that is well within specification now in line with the service manual uh, what we do now is we check the alarm trigger on the uh, on the AF on the RF input so we adjust it to just over one watt for the remove RF trigger warning to appear um, and we're okay up to about two two and a half watts on this port before any continuous level of, of damage would occur um, so the Marconi manual sets out that to do that test you increase it to about 1.25 1.5 watts on that port and then the alarm should trigger so that's what we're going to do now so we're going to increase the RF level we're obviously up to one watt there now and then any moment and then we remove the RF altogether it should come back so that proves that the um, trigger level um, and we'll just go back to where we were before um, which is there 400 300 milliwatts which is back to specification where it was and you can adjust that you know and that's one watt of RF power there We'll test the sensitivity on this right the way down as well and then we'll just reduce it reduce it back so so we're talking microwatts there uh, in the realms of roughly 
I would say on auto tune 15 16 microwatts so that's the sensitivity level of the uh, TX monitor on the low power port now we also in this test we're looking for frequency accuracy and obviously the higher the signal the more frequency accurate it will be uh, so we're back to just over 400 milliwatts there and uh, we've got a frequency accuracy of 299.999994 megahertz so again if we do uh, TX and frequency 300 megahertz to check that the offset is within its specification and uh, as we can see there when we zoom in uh, you'll be able to see that there look we're only like 60 hertz off so that's well within specification so both the RF power meter uh, the modulation meter and the frequency offset meter all well within specification um, so there's nothing wrong at all with that uh, that measurement on both the uh, high power port and the and the low power port nothing at all uh, the only thing that remains now is to check um, to see whether the TX monitor can read the um, um, I'll just switch that mod off the tones so we can go to TX test on there you can go to sequential for example select EA and then now we're ready to uh, modulate that signal with a tone standard and to see whether the TX signal inside decoders within the test set do actually uh, work so that's what we'll do next okay so now what we're going to do is we're going to go to um, our encoder on here we're then going to go to um, uh, tone sequence and we're going to go to uh, EA and there's a symbol sequence up here after a thousand years of navigating through that one two three four five and then basically we're going to um, gen 2 I'm going to set that to 3 kilohertz and then we're going to go here and click send so when I press that button there will the other tones come up on the um, on the radio test set and uh, we'll be able to check that it sends this sequence uh, which is at the top left here one two three four five so we'll just go now to the the screen and now I'm going to hit send on the mark on the Agilent and then obviously it's decoding that one two three four five okay if I do return tones DTMF and then uh, we've got received data as well so again I can go to on here on the Agilent test set I can go then to standard um, tone sequence DTMF and then obviously we can send that sequence there up in the top left um, and then I can basically send that now to the Marconi so let's see if that, that's received in the received data field on there so that's all worked fine without a problem no problem at all so again no problem there the next one I want to test is subaudible tone so I want to be able to make sure that the 300 Hz low pass filters work on the Marconi radio test set uh, so what I need to do now is go to um, tone, I think it's, would it be function generator? I can't remember now. Yeah, that's it. One kilo sine wave. And I want to change that to um, 67 hertz. That's what I want to do. That's the lowest CTCSS tone frequency. Tones in the CTCSS range, depending on the A B tones, it doesn't matter, they all slot between 67 to 250.3 Hz. So if we go back over to here now, 
and uh, I want to be able to pick that out using the low pass filter and as we can see there we are actually getting uh, if I can set the right filter 300 hertz low pass filter and we're getting there a mod frequency of 67 hertz and that's the modulation depth there normally CTCSS tones for most radio systems that are 12 and a half kilohertz is set to 350 hertz deviation and uh, that way then we, we would be analyzing that on a transmitter such as a radio transceiver and as we can see there we can decode the 67 hertz quite well no problem there at all obviously if I change the frequency to uh, 250.3 250.3 Hertz again we're obviously decoding that frequency and level as well at 350 Hertz deviation so that's checking the filters out without a problem um, so yeah all good okay so to recap what we've just gone through then those last two steps what we've done essentially is we've created a reference power level of 10 watts on an RF power amplifier which is a uh, a calibrated linear amplifier that I have here um, we've made a measurement on the Agilent test set to confirm that power we've then gone over and connected it to the Marconi on the high powered N-type port okay um, we've introduced 3 kilohertz deviation at 1 kilohertz tone modulation in FM uh, we've established that we're getting TX power reading correctly we've got the modulation reading 3 kilohertz deviation at one kilohertz tone and then what we've done then we've reduced the RF level right down on the port to check the switchable attenuator ranges which are on the frequency counter board and also the TX modulation on the RF power meter board and so what that's checking for is any holes in the attenuation or uh, dirty contacts on the relays things like that inoperative relays and then what's happened is we've had it in auto tune mode so that the frequency counter of the test set is then essentially searching for the frequency that it's picking up on the port so that shows that the frequency counter is working the TX power meter is working and also the modulation meter is working as well then we introduce the same level again uh, but at a reduced power at 1 watt um, on this port and we took it down to about was it 400 milliwatts thereabouts on the one watt port we then confirmed the alarm threshold on the one watt port by increasing the RF level above 1.25 watts which triggered the alarm we then decreased it back to where it was before and then we carried on further down much lower RF ranges to prove a sensitivity at the one watt port which turned out to be about a, mi a few microwatts Whereas on the N-type port, if you remember rightly, it was uh, about 0 dBm, 1 milliwatt was the sensitivity on that port. And that was about 5 or 6 microwatts thereabouts. So that proves the sensitivity of the ports. It proves the switchable attenuator ranges. And it also proved a frequency counter on both ports was working operably at the right levels and sensitivities. So then we progressed on to doing the tone modulation tests where in the TX test we're checking that the sequential tones decoder, DTMF decoder and then CTCSS decoder if you like was all functioning properly by injecting those tones and checking their errors and making sure that the test set reads them as it should do. So that concludes all tests with the TX side because we've measured all the parameters there that the test set does. The only one left is AM modulation. Um, and so well, let's have a look at that next okay so the amplitude modulation measurement now we set up 60% uh, mod at 300 megahertz at 1 kilohertz tone AM we're now going to check the AM demodulator on the mark coin so we're going to select the AM there and then what we're looking for is 60% modulation uh, on the screen there and we are we're getting that we're getting that level of uh, 60% modulation which is spot on and um, so there's nothing wrong with that so that we go 
Okay, so finally the moment of truth has arrived where after all that work of uh, doing all the um, repairs and the alignments and uh, ultimately now we arrive at the final section of the video where we actually do a self-test and that's sort of the, the final seal of uh, approval really that the test set's ready for uh, being returned back to its owner. So we'll press the help key, hit the self-test button and we'll click all tests and just let it run through its entire process and while it's doing that uh, we're looking obviously for a pass result coming up on the screen as we uh, we go down the instruments uh, test routine and hopefully fingers crossed uh, you know we'll uh, get the pass result all the way to the bottom because that's always a good sign yeah, certainly been a, an interesting repair. Not not too involved, to be quite honest. I mean, a lot of these Marconis that I get have got some real complex problems on them. Very, very severe faults and multiple faults and component failures and serious issues of some sort. But this particular test set, uh, really, um, only had minor issues. Um, so that was quite pleasing. But... Um, I hope you've enjoyed the video anyway and we've certainly gone through every single possible element there is in the test instrument and measuring all its parameters and calibration. Now it was pretty well spot on, um, you know it didn't need any major adjustments as such um, which is, is quite um, quite good, you know it's obviously been looked after by its owner and uh, not not too heavily mistreated and um, so the test set was, was, was quite good in that respect in so far as its calibration and accuracy um, so anyway um, I think we'll end the video here we've got obviously all past results on the screen which is always pleasing to see after such work and uh, thank you very much for joining me today and uh, if you like the video please consider subscribing helps the channel and there'll be more videos down the road um, and I think yes like anything these videos can be a bit lengthy but it's all unedited and what you see is what you get and it's not Hollywood production and um, you know at least it might give you confidence to do things yourself with your own test gear or venture into the world of test and measurement instruments and, uh, and try and do repairs so with that I bid you goodbye and see you in the next video bye for now